Welcome to the 26th meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Can I please remind everyone present uh, to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices. Um, firstly, um, uh, we need to decide whether to take items 4, 5, 6 and 7 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence from Scottish Government officials on the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill. We are therefore joined today by Alison Cumming, Sean Neill and John Sinclair. I'd like to welcome our witnesses this morning and invite Mr Neill to make a short opening statement. Mr Neill. Thank you for the opportunity to make a short opening statement on the Scottish Fiscal Commission Bill. The bill is a combination of around two years of work, including inquiries conducted by this committee and a government consultation. The bill gives the Scottish Fiscal Commission a basis in statute which, which safeguards its structural and operational independence and it also formalises the Commission's role in scrutinising the operation of Scotland's devolved fiscal framework. The Scottish Government has always intended that the Commission should have a legislative underpinning and <clears throat> is committed to, bring, committed to bring forward legislative proposals in the 14-15 programme for government. As the committee is aware, we published a consultation on the draft bill in March 2015. We have worked carefully over the summer to refine our legislative proposals. Reflecting on responses to our consultation, the evidence gathered by this committee and international best practice, including the work of the OECD and the IMF. The bill introduced to Parliament reflects a number of policy changes, which we consider further strengthen the independence of the Commission, which I'm sure we'll discuss later today. The most significant, significant of this is the removal of the requirement for the Commission to prepare other reports on fiscal matters as Scottish Ministers may from time to time require. This is a power <clears throat> that would appear at odds with our policy intention to create a Commission which is structurally, operationally and visibly independent of government. The Bill allows the Commission to prepare such reports on other fiscal matters as it considers appropriate. Importantly, the remit of the Commission, as set out in the Bill, is designed to reflect and be proportionate to the fiscal powers devolved to the Scottish Parliament under the Scotland Act 2012. The Commission's core function is to report to the Parliament and the public on tax estimates prepared by Scottish Ministers which underpin the Scottish Draft Budget. As such, the work of the Commission is central to the integrity of the Scottish Budget process. The Bill is also designed to provide flexibility and amend the Commission's future remit to reflect any expansion in fiscal powers the Scottish Par powers of the Scottish Parliament, including those contained within the Scottish Bill, Scotland Bill currently working through Westminster. We need to future-proof the Bill to ensure that the functions of the Commission adequately address any new settlement without recourse for primary legislation. The financial memorandum accompanying the Bill demonstrates that the Scottish Government is committed to providing the Commission with sufficient and appropriate resources to discharge its function and is to provide effective and robust security of the fiscal estimates underpinning the Scottish Budget. The Government has found the work <clears throat> that the Committee has undertaken on the creation of the Scottish Fiscal Commission to date very helpful in informing the development of our legislative proposals and we look forward to considering and reflecting the further evidence which the Committee will gather at Stage 1 of the Bill process and discussing our legislative proposals with you this morning. Okay, well, thank you very much for that uh, brief introduction. We'll, I'll go straight to questions uh, followed by from myself and then we'll allow other members of the committee to come in. Now obviously there's been quite a, an issue in terms of forecasting and you'll have read obviously uh, a report on the fiscal framework and uh, in particular recommendations paragraphs 131 through to 133. Uh, 131 we say of course uh, the committee is unaware of any other example of a fiscal council relying solely on official government forecasts and again the committee notes a strong level of support among witnesses for the SFC carrying out its own forecasts. Uh, so, so given that, I'm just wondering why um, the Scottish Government is, is insisting on being somewhat um, uh, different from other areas where uh, there are indeed other bodies able to uh, comment on fiscal forecasts, whether these are not produced independently. I think the, the Scottish Government position is that we, we do consider that what we're doing is, is consistent with other international best practice across the world. Um, the OECD and the IMF both recognise that the specific roles and functions um, of a fiscal commission um, should be tailored to the local political and institutional fiscal um, environments. Um, a couple of points. The, the Deputy First Minister has, has made clear to Parliament on several occasions um, that in his view 
responsibility for preparing tax forecasts which appear in the Scottish Budget um, is, the, is a primary responsibility of Scottish Ministers who should be directly accountable to the Parliament for those forecasts. Um, we believe that our approach maximises the transparency of the process um, for forecasting. It ensures that there's a full account of the government's forecasting methodology and the assumptions underpinning those forecasts um, in the public domain. But also importantly, um, out there is the results of independent scrutiny undertaken by the Commission. Um, and that would, would include their assessment um, of the forecasts and we would believe in future very clearly um, set out the impact of any specific recommendations that the Commission had made on the forecasting, excuse me, the forecasting process, uh, the forecast during the, the scrutiny process. I think looking at the, the, we've looked very carefully at the OECD evidence um, and uh, that's also reflected um, in the, the SPICE briefing on the bill. Um, and it's clear that there's a very small number of fiscal councils in operation across the world which produce the official forecasts um, for, uh, for governments, um, of which, of course, the, the UK Office for Budget Responsibility is one. Um, but the majority, in the majority of cases, the official forecasts are um, prepared by um, a, a Ministry of Finance or equivalent. Um, what we have sought to do through the bill is make very clear that um, the process for uh, how the, the Commission determines how it assesses the reasonableness of forecasts is a matter over which the, the government has no um, power of direction or no involvement whatsoever. And that's also clear in the, the framework document um, for the non-statutory Commission. Uh, but um, crucially, we've we haven't shut down in any way the Commission's ability to produce its own alternative forecasts um, of the, the tax revenues and other factors um, that are in um, that are within its remit and within the draft budget. Um, so we, we think that they're empowered both in terms of their, their legislative powers and also um, within the, the resources that we would provide we would propose to allocate to them as set out in the, the financial memorandum. So we think there is scope there for the Commission, if it so chooses, to prepare um, alternative forecasts. Uh, but um, importantly, that's, that's a matter um, for the Commission to determine. I mean, OK. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we've all got the same SPICE table, which talks about you know, the number of governments that actually produce their own forecasts. But the point that SPICE also made is, and I quote, it's common and independent fiscal institutions so there to be other economic and fiscal forecasts to draw on and both Irish and Swedish fiscal bodies have access to alternative forecasts and do not rely solely on government forecasts and I think that's really really the issue here I mean you, you've just said that the SFC can produce its own uh, forecasts but is that is that you know realistic in terms of the, given the fact that they also seem to be involved in producing the government's own forecasts. I mean, what, one thing I was going to ask you is what level of input does the Commission currently have in terms of helping to produce the government's forecasts? I see that the, the government has sole responsibility for producing forecasts. The role of the Commission is to, to challenge and scrutinise um, those forecasts. Um, in, in terms of how the, the process works um, at present, Scottish Government economists prepare forecasts and forecasting methodology papers which are presented to the Commission for discussion um, and are then the subject of, of scrutiny, um, very robust scrutiny and review by Commission members who will ask um, economists to, to justify the, the basis for um, the judgments that have, have been made and for the specific technical, um, the, the techniques um, that they have applied in arriving at those forecasts. Um, what, um, what we are working towards with the Commission at the moment is looking at ways that we can maximise the, the transparency of that scrutiny process. Um, obviously, it's, it's difficult to do that while the scrutiny process is ongoing, um, but we would anticipate that uh, when the, the Scottish draft budget is, is published, um, for 1617, and the Commission's um, report is published alongside that, um, we'd see very clearly what the, the impact of the Commission's scrutiny has been on the forecasts that have been prepared by the government, um, and also that would be very transparent as to what interactions have taken place 
um, and the nature of the interactions between the government and the Commission. Okay, I'm sure colleagues will want to explore this here um, further. I'm, I'm just going on to another area. I mean, the bill as introduced requires the Commission to publish its report on the assessment of the reasonableness of the forecast of the devolved taxes on the same day as the draft budget is published. Uh, why, why is that? It seems to me surely that one would expect the Commission to have some kind of time after the report is published to look at it rather than be effectively phoning you up while well, you're all scurrying around trying to get the, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's on the draft budget and they're kind of, you know, it, it just seems to me a, a recipe for not the most efficient or effective way of producing, um, you know, their, their, uh, their, re their report basically uh, if it's got to come out on the same day, what's the what's the thinking behind that? Um, the, the thing is, we see that the the scrutiny that the um, that the Commission provides on the fiscal forecasts and estimates prepared by the government is really central to the integrity of the Scottish budget process. Um, the, the Deputy First Minister has made clear on on several occasions um, that he would not want to bring forward forecasts to underpin a Scottish budget which were not um, assessed as reasonable. Um, by the independent commission. Um, and so we see that the, the, the big value, that, that the main area value that the, committee can, uh, that, sorry, that the commission can add is in having scrutinised and undertaken that scrutiny prior to publication of the budget so that when the budget comes forward, um, it's underpinned by forecasts which are re as robust and reasonable as they possibly can be, um, which is... That's similar, and I think there are there are parallels there um, with with public audit and, and other processes. So, in order to, to facilitate that, there is a requirement um, in in the bill, which I suspect we, we might want to explore further. Also, this morning, around that requires the Commission to send a copy of its report to the Scottish ministers in advance of, of laying it before Parliament, um, which which again is, is consistent with with the process for Audit Scotland reports. Um, but also that would provide, um, that provides the opportunity for the government to have access and to understand the, the nature of the Commission's findings, but importantly gives time for ministers, if they so choose, to revise their forecasts in line with the, the Commission's findings. Okay, it's 2013, the European Union has been putting pressure on Eurozone countries, as we, just, as we heard in a private session from Ian uh, Lena, uh, who's done a, um, an excellent piece of research into this area. Uh, they've, they've been putting uh, pressure for um, countries to look also at macroeconomic uh, forecasts as well. Now, in terms of the uh, further development, is there a proposal to perhaps uh, amend the bill to look at the sustainability of Scotland's macro? Uh, um, finances as we progress, given that, that, that kind of EU background? I think there's one of the sort of key sort of policy themes running through, the, the narratives running through our uh, policy proposals has been to recognise that the, the functions of the Fiscal Commission should be proportionate um, to the fiscal powers of the Parliament. Um, and so we've, we've sought to design a remit for the Commission which reflects um, that the current devolved competence um, of, of the Scottish Parliament. I think in, in terms of uh, fiscal sustainability, um, the Deputy First Minister has, has suggested to, to this committee on, on previous occasions that um, it, it, there's really a, a role there for Parliament in holding the government to account on the sustainability of, of its spending decisions. And obviously we will look closely at ways that we can um, we can expand the, the remit of the Commission to reflect further fiscal powers um, coming in, in a future or current Scotland Bill. Now, in, ter in terms of um, ensuring access to the information, the Bill uh, provides considerable discretion to Scottish Ministers to decide what can reasonably be provided within reasonable time limits. Um, should the Bill not be more uh, unequivocal in this area? This may be an area where, where John St. Clair might wish to, to expand on, on what I say just now. In Section 7, um, we consider we've put forward a very robust um, right of, of access to information um, for the Commission, and specifically it's a right of, of access for the Commission rather than a right to request information. Um, what we, we would be looking to do is to, to underpin this, the, the statutory provisions um, with, a, with a more 
detailed memorandum of understanding which would explain how, how these things would work in practice. But um, it's, we, we consider we've brought forward a very robust um, right of access there, but obviously we're, we're very open to, to suggestions as to how we could further strengthen that. John? Yes, as, as Alison said, there is a statutory right to the information and then there is this very powerful uh, right to require information. We don't mention legal powers in the bill, but these could be invoked if necessary by declarator or some sort of other action in the court of session if there was a circumstance in which somebody refused to hand over information or to give explanation. But because it's dealing with government departments, uh, it's almost inconceivable that one bit of the administration litigates against another. It's, one doesn't put that in statute. Although there are legal backup powers, they won't be invoked. What usually happens is that there is some sort of MOU as well between departments or some sort of political settlement because it's a sign of, it would be a sign of a sort of crisis if one bit of the administration isn't able to get information that it's entitled to out of another bit of the administration. So we think this is robust. As to reasonability, that's very common, so that you don't, you, you couldn't, you could ask for almost any information, but you can't ask for, we need every single taxpayer's report by tomorrow afternoon. That's the sort of thing that that is trying to stop. And the, the powers of Revenue Scotland uh, are framed in very similar terms and it runs throughout most of the tax legislation. There's, you've, you've got to be, it's got to be tempered to a certain extent so that you don't overload departments with requests. Okay, thank you. Uh, and now, in turn, we know uh, from the bill how much additional funding is going to be provided to the Scottish Fiscal Commission, but how much internal resources are being allocated within the Scottish Government in order to help uh, prepare and enhance the quality of forecasts? So, <clears throat> um, as Alison mentioned, there's been input from uh, across a number of analytical services and departments across the Government. So, um, both within my division, um, Alison and Alison's team work with very closely with the Commission and across um, key areas such as environmental communities and the Office of the Chief Economic Advisor have all allocated significant amount of resources to support the work in, in assessing the reasonableness of, of our forecasts. Okay. Now, uh, just one other topic before I go on to allow colleagues in, which is um, um, in terms of the OECD developing a number of minimum requirements, are principles deemed suitable uh, uh, you know, for taking forward uh, such commissions regardless of local circumstances? Have all these principles been met? Um, we consider that they have been, yes, to, to the extent that it's, it's possible for the, the government to do that. There's a number of the principles which obviously relate to um, the, the Commission's activities and the way that the, the Commission conducts itself. Um, but we've set out our assessment within the policy memorandum um, of how we believe that our legislative proposals um, deliver against um, the, the OECD principles. And one of the, the policy changes that we introduced following um, the, the consultation on the draft bill, um, which we held this spring and summer, um, was to bring forward the statutory requirement for independent evaluation of the Commission's performance every five years. And that was driven um, in part by the responses to the consultation, but also in reflecting further on um, how we could ensure that the bill reflected the OECD principles, one of which is to ensure that, the, that such a body's um, work is subject to, to external scrutiny. OK, thank you for that. Sorry, Sean, I thought you were going to add something. No, not at all. I was, I was only going to mention that that sits alongside the annual report that the Commission has to be prepare, um, which sets out, you know, um, how, how, they're, how they're getting on with, with, their, with their work. So it was just to say that it sits alongside the annual report requirement that sets out in the bill. OK, a number of colleagues now want to come in with questions. The first one will be Gavin, to be followed by Jackie. Um, let's go to <coughs> section four of the bill then. Um, the convener asked you a bit about uh, ministers getting copies of reports prior to the reports going to Parliament. Can you just reiterate again the, the policy reason for why ministers would get them before Parliament? Um, it's, 
it's really around um, ensuring that the, the process of scrutiny is supporting the integrity of the Scottish budget process so that there's an opportunity for ministers to ensure that the forecasts that they bring forward to Parliament in the draft budget have been independently assessed as reasonable. And we, we consider that there's a, a public interest um, in ensuring that the forecasts which underpin the Scottish budget are independently assessed as robust. Um, we, we do recognise um, that there's a need for, for such arrangements to, to be as transparent as possible. Um, and we have been discussing with, with the Commission the possibility of, of developing a, a protocol similar to the protocols that exist between the Scottish Government and Audit Scotland um, that are published as, as annexes to the Scottish Public Finance Manual that would, would provide um, Parliament and the, the public with some information on, on how the, the relationship was to be managed. Um, and how um, information was to, to be exchanged in that way, including draft reports and final reports. Okay. In, in terms of, so it's going to mirror the, in some ways, the Audit Scotland process. So in, ter so in terms of timing, then, I mean, while there might not be exact uh, details in there, what, what sort of timing are you envisaging the Scottish Government would get a report before Parliament? Yeah, I mean, it's really, I say, be a matter for, for agreement with the Commission. It isn't something that we would. Um, seek to, to dictate or specify to the Commission. If we took Audit Scotland as an example, um, the Scottish Government receives uh, a, sort of a clearance draft to, to check for factual accuracy and has uh, three weeks to provide comments on the factual accuracy of that report. Um, and thereafter, the, the protocol requires that the um, Scottish Government is provided with a an embargoed copy of the final report three days prior to publication, which would be to, to support um, handling um, off. So, so that would, I suggest, that probably be a benchmark that we would use as, the, as perhaps an opening uh, basis for discussion with the Commission, but it would be very much um, be based on timescales that the Commission was comfortable with. Okay. So, th so there's, no, I mean, there's no fixed answer yet, but, it, but your understanding as it is that it, 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 we could have a scenario where the Scottish Fiscal Commission are sending a report, a clearance draft to the Government three weeks before Parliament sees it, and then they get an embargoed copy three days before Parliament sees it? Potentially. That's, that's how it works for, for Audit that's Scotland. Right. Um, and it may, it may depend, obviously, the, the budget process um, can, can be quite a sort of time-pressured process. So it's not to say three weeks would be the appropriate period for, for this, but that's um, what we would take as, as a reference point for the discussions with the Commission. It's, it's, it's probably important that you know, to be absolutely clear, whenever we talk about clearance, it would be clearance for things like factual, factual accuracy as opposed to clearance of the report. The report produced by the Fiscal Commission is its own report. It's done independently of, of government, and, and we shouldn't in any way seek, or, um, seek to, to influence what's in that report as such. Okay. I mean, uh, it's maybe not a question you can answer, but would, would you envisage areas where there were disputes or discussions over the clearance draft being made public at some point later? I think, I mean, the, if there were any disputes to be had, it would be over factual accuracy. And I think that the Commission, um, our experience with the Commission is the Commission would obviously want to be assured that whatever they were putting in the public domain was, was factually accurate also. I mean, we're, we're very mindful of some of the exchanges that there's been um, in Westminster in recent months over um, the exchanges between Treasury and the OBR on, on draft reports. Um, so I think we... So, so far as was possible and practical, we would um, seek to be transparent um, around any ch sort of changes that, that may have been made. But all, as, as Sean was saying, the only changes we would envisage would be where we were perhaps clarifying the understanding of the, the forecasting pr processes and methodologies that we had, um, that we had, that the Scottish Government had put in place. Um, that there's very robust measures in the bill and also in the framework document for the non-statutory commission, which make clear that the government would not be seeking to influence the commission's judgments in any way or the commission's presentation um, of their findings. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'll move on to a, a different issue, if I can. I think I'm referring to section two of the bill, but let me just make sure I am referring to... Yeah, so se section two talks about the functions of the commission. Um, Section 2, subsection 1A, um, the Commission looks at forecasts of receipts for devolved taxes, so that's fairly straightforward. Section B, I've, I've, I have to say I struggle with, 
instead of looking at the forecasts for non-domestic rates, we look at the assumptions made by the Scottish Ministers in relation to the determinants described in subsection 2 being the economic determinants on which the Scottish Minister's forecast of receipts uh, from non-domestic rates are based. Um, now, I looked at what the OBR did, and the OBR basically produced a forecast uh, for non-domestic rates. Why, why would we not just have a fiscal commission who can uh, look at the forecasts for domestic rates and take a view on the overall forecast as opposed to uh, you know, this more sort of convoluted approach? The, the approach that's set out in the bill for non-domestic rates is, is consistent with the, the role that the non-statutory commission has in relation to, to the economic determinants of, of non-domestic rate forecasts, um, which are, are defined as, as the buoyancy assumption and the inflationary assumption. Um, a, a decision was taken in designing the remit of the, of the non-statutory commission that there are elements um, of the non-domestic rate forecast that are driven by commercial assumptions um, on issues such as, as bad debts and appeal losses, um, which are based on experience and assessments made by Scottish Government and local authorities. And these areas of judgment may not be um, so suitable or, or suited to the expertise of the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission, which would be more focused on, on economic um, forecasting assumptions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you're right to say it mirrors exactly the, the non statute mm -hmm. functions. I accept that. But I, I didn't really understand or accept at the time why the non statute functions are that way. If, if the OBR, and obviously the OBR is bigger, but if other fiscal commissions or the OBR can forecast the likely um, uh, how much we're going to collect in business rates, it, I'm still confused as to why a Scottish fiscal commission couldn't equally assess the overall likely forecast as opposed to just looking at the buoyancy factors. I mean, is it clear to, or can you explain why they simply couldn't? forecast business rates? No, but I'd say it, was, it was around this area of the, the commercial assumptions and whether um, the, those would be areas that the Commission would be able to, to reach a judgment on in the same way that they were on the, the economic um, factors driving the forecast based on the fact that, that these tend to be very judgmental based assumptions and also um, based um, on experience and, um, and some commercially sensitive data. I mean, it's, it's certainly um, an issue. I think the Deputy First Minister's position was, was clear at, at the time that he, those were the, the areas of, of non-domestic rates that he considers suitable for the Commission to review, but it's certainly something we will reflect on um, further. Well, I, th I think that's fair enough. And I, I, you know, of course, there are commercial judgments, but I just think if, if we're asking them to look at stamp duty land tax, which is, uh, sorry, LBTT, I should say, uh, the successor to SDLT, that, that's volatile and requires commercial assumptions too. Um, I just, I'm still at a loss as, as to why, but you've, you've said you reflect upon it. I suppose that the same question then for me goes when I look at what the OBR do, they forecast council tax uh, as well. And I'm just wondering why... Um, we're not asking them to look at the forecast for council tax, which obviously will have a big impact on public uh, spending in Scotland. Yeah. The, in, in designing the, the scope of the Fiscal Commission, we've focused um, very much on uh, assess forecasts um, that underpin the Scottish budget. Um, so because the, the Scottish budget is not underpinned by council tax, forecast their matters for, for local authorities. Um, we haven't uh, provided for a bill in relation, uh, sorry, a, a function in the bill in relation to council tax. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, that mirrors the, the non-statutory position, but uh, and I, I did accept that one at the time. But I just wonder, going forward, um, okay, it doesn't affect the, the Scottish budget exactly, but it does affect the economic position and, and the spending power of, of councils, and therefore Scotland as a whole. And I just wonder if that's something that, has the government reached a fixed view on that, or is that something they may be prepared to reflect upon? I think it, it does come, come back to this, um, this sort of fundamental question as to if the Commission's primary role is in relation to, to the Scottish budget or into wider public finance issues. Okay. All right, if I could move on to the, uh, the last issue for me, which is uh, usually the, the one that I guess takes up the most time, but the convener has, has clearly covered uh, that in a bit of detail. Forecasting. Yeah. Um, now, the Scottish Government position is, um, I think you said it again today, what, what we're doing is consistent with international best practice. Um, now, you're right to say that not every uh, uh, fiscal commission does the official forecast, and I think there are, there are three who do the official forecast, so I accept that entirely, uh, of whom the OBR is one. 
Where I'm struggling, though, is, is, is here. When I look at all the other fiscal commissions that I've been able to, to look at, and I've looked at it through independent experts, through SPICE and anyone else I can find, every other one that I've been able to see either prepares alternative forecasts or has access to independent alternative forecasts, whether they are IMF, OECD, EU, um, or another body such as in Sweden. What I have not been able to find, and I ask this question quite genuinely, I have been, been able to find any fiscal commissions who look only at government forecasts, and that is the only um, option they have got for making a decision. H has the Scottish Government done research here? And given that you have said it is consistent with international best practice, what are the countries where the fiscal commissions only look at the government forecasts? I think there is there's two main areas of points that like to make here. The first is in relation to um, the, the, the fact that the consideration about the role of the Commission being proportionate to the fiscal powers of the, of the Parliament. Um, I think be, the way that we are establishing here a, a, a fiscal commission for a sub-sovereign Parliament, um, which perhaps changes the nature of the, the forecasts and assumptions that the Commission is, is looking at um, compared to the, the sovereign commissions um, that um, exist uh, across the world. So what we're looking at um, is, I, t to my knowledge, I don't think, I think what they would be looking at in terms of alternative forecasts and sovereign commissions is for forecasts of things like um, GDP assumptions and, and so forth, or, or aggregate, fiscal aggregates, not necessarily looking at alternative forecasts for individual taxes, um, which, which tend to be treated in, in a slightly different way. Um, to that extent, um, we have sought within the bill to empower the Commission um, to determine how it assesses the reasonableness of forecasts. Um, and uh, within that, it's, it's open to the Commission to determine that the best way to do that is to prepare alternative forecasts, either itself or by commissioning those um, from, from external parties. And we've, we included provision in the financial memorandum for external research costs. Um, we've, we've also underpinned um, that, as we discussed, by a, a, a right to, um, to a right of access, a right to receive data um, from the, the Scottish Government um, and from, from Revenue Scotland and, and other associated um, public bodies that would, that would hold relevant data. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult for the government to comment too much on what the, the Commission should do in this area, because clearly it is a matter for the Commission. But what we have sought to do is to, through the legislation, um, to enable the Commission to do that and not to restrict the Commission's ability to do that in any way. OK. Um, it, I mean, you may not have a, a live example of a country now, fair enough, but I just I ask if the Bill team... It, it, are there examples, um, <laughs> international examples, where... They only look at the government forecast. I, I'm genuinely interested to see that because I haven't, I haven't found any, and I have looked quite hard. And I do take your point about subnational legislatures. Um, it is slightly different, but at the end of the day, if we get it wrong, or if we do suffer from optimism bias, we're left with the same problems, and yes. that we suddenly we've got a shortfall. So it's maybe not quite as big a degree as, as uh, if it was if you're national, but it will grow year on year and it could become a, a pretty big problem for us. I, I simply leave that, leave that okay. part out there. Um, on the last point you made, though, about how you don't want to be too prescriptive uh, on, on how they do their job, I, I have to say I was quite heartened uh, by what you said. I've, I've scribbled it down, so I might not quote you exactly, but you've said, you said basically we haven't shut down the Fiscal Commission's ability to prepare alternative forecasts. Now, I, I hope that that's correct, but it does... It just does seem slightly at odds with the, at least the tone of the of previous, previous evidence I've heard from the government where, um, and I, again, I can't quote exactly, but the impression to me was given that if they were doing alternative forecasts, that would be unnecessary duplication. And it certainly seemed to me that the government view at that time was that, uh, A, they didn't want to put it in the bill, and B, they actually wanted this, to discourage it because they felt it would be duplication. Is, is the government view different now? I mean, are, saying that we haven't shut the door is slightly different to saying we actually think it would be quite a good, good idea and we wouldn't actually be against it. I mean, is there, and again, maybe you can't go too far on this, but is, is there a government view that actually alternative forecasting would actually be a positive thing 
or are you simply saying we wouldn't legally block it? I think it's important just to, to be clear that, that what we're saying is we've left the option open to the Scottish Fiscal Commission to determine itself how it comes to its assessment of reasonableness. What we also did when, when we were looking at the financial memorandum was we had an engagement and a dialogue about the resources that they felt in, you know, the non-statutory uh, commission needed to discharge these sets of functions, and that's reflected both within the, the, the financial memorandum and the resources that are set aside, both, as Alison said, for the staffing and also potential further research. So I, I think we're, what we're very clearly saying here is, is we want to leave it up to the Commission to determine how they assess reasonableness and what we're trying to do is enable that by giving them the resources and also the, the legislative cover if they think that's the right way to do it in section 2.5. Okay, so just to be clear, it, it is not now or certainly no longer the, the official government view that alternative forecasts would be duplication? I think there's been there have been um, considerations and issues around um, if the Fiscal Commission were preparing official forecasts, that the government would also need to produce its own forecasting models to support ongoing policy development and financial planning. Um, so there, there would be, clearly if the, if the Fiscal Commission is preparing um, alternative forecasts, there is potentially a, a duplication um, of, of effort there. But as Sean says, it's a, a matter for the Commission to determine. OK, thank you. I'll leave it. Oh, there may sure. be another point, just a practical point, that if the Commission – we're leaving it to the Commission to decide about the, whether there are forecasts – but if the Commission is actually saying that the government's forecasts are unreasonable, one would expect that they would identify what they thought was the reasonable way of doing it, and it would then be up to either them or outsiders to work the projections from the reasonable basis. So it may already be implicit in if there was a criticism of reasonability. OK. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, next question will be from John to be followed by Mark. Oh, sorry, Jack, I thought you'd been already. It's a long Are you suggesting Gavin has been going on for too long? I wouldn't dream of suggesting <laughs> Certainly not. Jackie to be followed by John. Apologies for that. Um, I will be much briefer than I intended because a lot of the ground has, has been covered. But let me come back to testing the point of independence because I think that is critical in, in um, people's acceptability of, of the Commission um, when it appears. Um, the relationship with Audit Scotland is an interesting one and the parallel you choose to draw there because um, I remember in the not too dim and distant past a degree of controversy over the sharing of an Audit Scotland report with the government um, and the changes made being considered and I point to those critical of it at the time as being not factual but presentational. Surely it is in the government's interest to have the Fiscal Commission acting truly independently to avoid any perception that there is this kind of collusion behind the scenes. And therefore, do you think the Audit Scotland model is appropriate? Um, and secondly, let, let me just say, I would absolutely agree in terms of same-day reporting if it was the OBR, because the OBR do the official forecasting for the UK government. This is not something you're asking the Fiscal Commission to do, and therefore I think a separation in time actually might not be a bad thing, because if we're being honest about it, the, the capacity in Scotland, even in government, to do this kind of forecasting is limited, and we will need to kind of increase that capacity um, for Scotland as a whole. So, so I can't imagine a situation where you, know, you are waiting for the Fiscal Commission to tell you it's okay, because you're the ones with most of the capacity to do this kind of thing. So I wonder whether you would comment on both of those. Certainly. And I think in terms of, of Audit Scotland, the example of the protocol was really more in terms of the, the process, that there is a published protocol, just showing that that does specify things like time limits. I'm not saying that the, that would be replicated in its entirety for the Fiscal Commission. There are, there are clearly um, other considerations that the Scottish Government has been very um, robust in its position that um, we will not seek to influence the, the judgments that the Commission takes um, 
on our forecasts, but I think it's important um, for the, the Commission's own credibility um, also that there is that opportunity to comment on factual accuracy. I don't think that's, that's in dispute um, with everyone. So what we would be seeking to do is to ensure that the, the protocol was very clear and continued the theme that's in the, the framework document for the non-statutory Commission, that within any um, clearance draft, for, for want of a better term, that was submitted to, to the Scottish Government, um, it would only be matters of um, factual accuracy that the, that, the com that the Government was offering any views to the Commission on. Um, we would not be seeking to offer any views on um, the Commission's um, findings or indeed how they presented those findings. Um, but history tells us that that's not necessarily the case in all of the government's dealings with people that they have, you know, understandings with. And therefore, I wonder, again, to guard against um, any suggestion that the Fiscal Commission is tied up with the government, that if there is this process of, you know, advance notification to allow for factual accuracies, that you will, as a matter of course, publish any amendments made. That's certainly something that we will take back and discuss with the Commission, um, we are we are certainly we are very much open to any ways in which we can we can maximise the, the transparency um, of the, the relationship and the interactions um, between the Scottish Fiscal Commission and the, the, the Scottish Government. Um, I, I can't comment on on any previous um, Audit Scotland reports. I think so. Coming on to your, your second set of, of points. Um, around the, the desirability of the Scottish Government having access to, to a report in advance and the reports being published at the same time, effectively, when, when the Deputy First Minister, Finance Secretary of the Day, stands up to, to deliver the draft budget, um, is, is really around, comes down to this point about the, the value that the Fiscal Commission adds to the integrity of the Scottish budget process. Um, we would suggest that it may not be in the, the public interest for a government to bring forward uh, a budget um, underpinned um, by tax forecasts which determine the overall amount of, of spending power available to that government, um, which um, the, the independent experts then subsequently would say that those forecasts are unreasonable. So we'd see that the, the public interest would be in maintaining the integrity of the draft budget process, that the draft budget that's brought to Parliament sort of comes with that um, assessment having already taken place, so that there is not then a subsequent need um, to revise other parts of the budget um, to, to reflect um, changes in the forecasts after the, the draft budget has been published. But the budget, by its very nature, gets revised as it makes its way through Parliament. So surely this isn't a difficult thing um, for the government to do? I, I may not be practically difficult, but I think it comes down to we think that the integrity of the Scottish draft budget is, is maximised by this um, assessment having taken place prior to, to publication and then there being complete transparency over um, that assessment. Sure. It could equally, you'd expect me to say from the perspective of the Finance Committee, um, lend to more robust scrutiny. Um, can I just deal with flexibility and forecasts? You, you've dealt with a lot of it um, with Gavin Brown, but you know, if you are prepared to be that flexible, you point to Section 25. I confess I don't have the wording in front of me, but does that actually explicitly give the power to the Fiscal Commission um, to produce or to, if it chooses to do so, do some forecasting themselves? Uh, 2.5 um, provides that reports that are prepared by the Commission may include other such information relating to the assessments being made as the Commission considers appropriate. Um, so what that, that power would enable the Commission to, to publish um, alternative forecasts. Um, where um, we see it is that um, we have section six is a, the key section as well in making clear that, that it's for the commission and not subject to government direction as to how the commission undertakes its assessment of reasonableness. Um, so it's really implicit in there that the commission can determine how it undertakes that assessment um, and if it so chooses can prepare um, it be a matter of the Commission to determine whether it prepares alternative forecasts um, or assumptions um, as part of that. Um, the, the, so in discussing um, with our legal counsel, we don't see that there would be, John might want to add to this, that there would, there's no 
legal requirement, um, as we understand it, to, to specifically provide for a function to allow the Commission to prepare alternative forecasts, but that's something we, we can look at. Um, and certainly the explanatory notes to the Bill um, make clear that the, the Commission is, is it's open to the Commission to consider the effect of alternative forecasting assumptions or methodologies on revenue forecasts. Yeah, our, our, legal position, our legal advice would be that the Bill leaves it wide open for the for the Commission to make uh, explicit alternative forecasts or, alternatively, it can just uh, identify where reasonableness is not... Uh, a, there hasn't been reasonableness, provide what it thinks is reasonable, and then have others make the projections. Palm equally, given that you are open to it, the Government appears open to it, to actually put it on the face of the bill. That's something that we can reflect on. Okay. Um, finally, convener, um, I promise again, I'm, I'm sticking with with um, the independence of the fiscal commission. Um, you take quite sweeping powers in section 26 um, for ministers to be able to change the functions by regulation. Um, you'll naturally expect me to prefer primary legislation to regulation because there's a greater degree of scrutiny. Um, is that something that you would shift on? Because I think um, the importance of this body demands primary legislation. Um, and secondly, Scottish Government is quite heavily involved in the appointment of members to the Fiscal Commission. Scotland is a small place. Um, we tend to all know each other. So again, in, in wanting to ensure the independence of the, the body, um, what other options did you consider because we've been presented with alternative suggestions that don't involve the Scottish Government but are very robust. Okay. Um, I think I'll just on section 26, um, might ask John to come in afterwards just to explain the, the legal position on section 26. But certainly, um, it would be our intention that that is more a contingency or emergency provision than something that would be um, routinely used. Um, but John will be able to, to comment on, on that in greater detail. Um, and certainly, just as an example, um, Section 5 provides the power for Scottish ministers to uh, bring forward regulations to um, confer additional functions, to modify or, or remove functions. Um, and what we've, we've sought to do is, is entrench some of the core um, functions of the Commission in primary legislation so that they, they can't be amended um, using or removed sorry, using um, those regulation-making powers. So it, we do very much see that that's, there are areas where we need to provide flexibility, but in terms of the, the core functions and operation of the Fiscal Commission, that would be seen primarily as a matter for, for primary legislation. Um, in, in terms of, of the appointment process, um, I think we... We have looked at um, examples of how this works for, for ministerial appointments. I think the, the key um, element for us is that the ministerial appointments um, are all regulated by the um, Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland um, and that, uh, that the appointments process would be subject um, to the Code of Practice for ministerial appointments to public bodies in Scotland, um, which would provide um, safeguards uh, as to the fair and open competition and to the process and ensuring that appointments um, are made on merit. And then thereafter, we have um, the, the veto effectively for Parliament um, to, to scrutinise um, those, uh, those appointments that are, the nominations that are brought forward um, for appointment as, as the, the Finance Committee and, and the Parliament did for the appointments to the Non-Statutory Commission. Sorry. Tiny question, convener. Did you consider alternative options? This is the, the policy position that the government has arrived at. Thank you, convener. Thank you. John, to follow by Mark. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, I mean, just to follow up the point that Jackie Bailey was making, on the qu question of delegated powers, I mean, the, I know the Delegated Powers uh, Committee has looked at this, uh, being a member of it as well. Um, so it's one of the thinkings with having the, the, the powers as they are and giving ministers a uh, power is that as devolution progresses, um, you wouldn't need to have primary legislation every time a new tax or a new power came. Is that kind of broadly the thinking? We're sort of recognising um, that we're, we're going through a, a process at, at present um, where 
considering uh, devolution of further fiscal powers to the Scottish Parliament. So what we wanted to do was ensure that there was reasonable flexibility within the bill um, for Parliament to, to modify the functions in future to reflect any expansion in fiscal powers without having recourse to primary legislation. Okay. I, think some, I think some of that is set out in, in the way some of it's drafted. So we, we talk about devolved taxes in its broadest sense instead of naming the two devolved taxes. So it would cover all devolved taxes. So wherever possible, we've tried to future-proof it. But we also recognise that, you know, um, that this is, 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 is you know, uh, devolution of further powers is, is currently in transition. Yes, because I mean, it strikes me that I mean, we've had we've got devolved taxes like land LBTT, but we've also got assignment of taxes, in, as in the case of VAT. So there might even be more options in, in the future. Yes. So but you're you're fairly comfortable that what we've got here would cover all of these options. It, it would cover um, the devolution of of. of sorry, it would cover the full devolution of tax powers in in relation to, for example, the powers for replacements for stamp duty land tax and and. UK landfill tax, um, so air passenger duty and aggregates levy would be automatically covered um, within those, uh, within the, the existing power and the way that we've defined devolved taxes. Um, for, for assigned revenues for VAT, for example, that would be an area that um, would need to be considered depending on how that power was, was, is framed um, and how the fiscal framework operates is probably in terms of who provide, produces the forecast. But if Scottish ministers were producing VAT forecasts to support assignment of VAT, then you could envisage um, an additional function being conferred on the, on the Commission to review the, the reasonableness um, of those forecasts. So in, in the uh, public consultation that went out, um, there was also a list of potential other functions that could be covered by the, the Fiscal Commission, and that was set out in reference to further devolution. Okay, thanks very much. Um, now, obviously, we've spent a lot of time on um, who makes forecasts and all of that kind of stuff, so I don't want to repeat all that, but I, I do just wonder, I mean, if the Scottish Fiscal Commission was to be really setting up a complete model, forecasting model of its own, have we any ideas what that would cost? Um, we we don't have specific estimates um, of that. Um, it would would depend on how the the commission wished to to go about that. Um, also, but in drawing up the the estimates in the the financial memorandum, um, they were produced in consultation with members of the non statutory commission, and they are intended um, to to cover um, in, in the terms of the total resource envelope the the resource that the commission feels would be required to exercise its its scrutiny as set out in the bill. So at the moment we've got £850,000 per year going forward. I mean, you know, if they were to be doing substantial forecasting, would we be talking double that or triple that? Have we? Uh, I, I would see that the if we look at the, the categories of, of staffing costs, um, there may be a requirement to increase the, the staffing um, allocation for strategic and analytical support to, to the Commission. Um, but or the Commission may wish to, to make use of um, the, the provision we've suggested um, for, for research of around £100,000. Um, but it's, it's difficult to, without um, being able to specify exactly what the Commission might want to, to do here, it's difficult to put a precise figure on it, but it would it'd very much be um, a matter for the, the Commission. And clearly, if the Commission felt that they were not... Um, adequately resourced within that resource envelope, then that's um, something that the government would take very seriously and discuss further with the Commission. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to press you unreasonably because I'm asking for something that obviously you're not planning to do. But, I mean, is there any idea, for example, in the government how many staff are involved in forecasting or is it not that clear cut because staff are doing umpteen different jobs? I, I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a very good assessment of, of forecasting. There, there would be very a very limited number of people who exclusively do forecasting in the government. They, they undertake an, a number of different roles, including forecasting. So it would be quite difficult to say exactly how much of their job was spent doing exclusively forecasting as opposed to other, uh, you know, undertaking other analysis. Or, or, or I mean, I just I think it would be useful going forward um, if we did have some ideas to what extra costs might be involved because this is it's clearly a key issue and for me one of the answers to it is the cost so um, you know it helps us I think make our decision I realise the bill's got its, its decision already or its proposal 
Um, but if it was possible at some stage in the future to get any kind of figure on that, I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, I mean, the relationship between, well, Audit Scotland and government, but I think auditors in general and their clients um, is, is relevant. In, the, in one sense, I see the Fiscal Commission as auditing the forecasts uh, that the government's made. And, and the relationship between the two, I mean, is it your understanding that auditors of any organisation would be in the organisation, any large organisation, would be in it throughout the year assessing what is going on? They do not just turn up on the 31st of March or whatever. I mean, you, or, or is that not a fair comparison? No, I, I think um, I'm, I'm an accountant by profession and I have experience of, of both the auditor and auditee side um, of the, the public audit relationship. Um, so that would be very much my experience that um, there is uh, engagement and a review of systems and controls, uh, for example, of uh, underpinning um, the financial management and, and financial reporting arrangements throughout the year. So it's, it's something that it, the, the audit parallelism is very familiar to me and I think does offer um, a, a very helpful comparison with how the, the Fiscal Commission might conduct its work, that really there needs to be an opportunity for, for that kind of challenge and scrutiny to take place. Um, what might look behind the scenes, but for very much the product of that um, to be made as transparent as possible thereafter. And one of the, the specific parallels I would draw is that um, in terms of auditing of the, the financial accounts, clearly the, the, the government or the audited body puts forward its, its draft and audited accounts um, for review by, by the auditor. The auditor undertakes its work, and at the end of that process, there's a report prepared by the auditor which very clearly sets out the adjusted audit differences which have impacted on how the, um, the accounts presented for audit may have changed before the, the final signed off versions for audit, but we'd also draw out any unadjusted material audit differences um, that have been identified during the, the process so that there's transparency over what the, the, the areas that the auditor, the external scrutineer, has, has looked at and that that's put in the public domain um, thereafter. So, so you would argue it is possible for an auditor or like an auditor of the Fiscal Commission to engage throughout the year on a regular basis but maintain their independence? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the, there was mention when we talked about the access, right of access, I think it was Mr Sinclair mentioned the possibility of a memorandum of understanding. Is, is that something that needs to be referred to in the bill or... Do we not need that in the bill? We wouldn't. That was just. A, it was just an, uh, memorandums of understanding are are informal. They're not legally binding, but they're usually just expressing on paper a, a, an ongoing relationship between two bits of the administration, and they're not. I've never seen them referred to in legislation. Yeah, legislation. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think we, we had broadly been comfortable with the idea of people just doing one fixed term. Although I still have the. Uh, members of the Commission, that is, um, the wonder if, you know, we do have actually that many skilled people in Scotland. I, I suppose we could be, use people from outside. As I understand it, from one of the reports we saw in Ireland, they have a, a maximum of two a, terms of duty or a, spells on the, on the Commission. Is, is that something the government's really committed to, the one term, or do you think two terms might work? Um, this is uh, something the, the Deputy First Minister has so been quite clear in his position, I think, right might even have been from the, the January 2014 evidence, but certainly in bringing forward um, the proposals for the non-statutory commission, um, the, the Scottish Government would see it as one of the, the key safeguards we can put in place to support the independence, um, the institutional independence of the commission, is to ensure that there's no perception in their reporting that they are having any regard to their personal prospects of reappointment um, and how they are they are reporting their findings or, or how the conclusions that they reach. Um, so it, it is something that, that we see as strengthening um, the independence um, of the Commission. OK, thank you. Um, I think Audit Scotland said that uh, if the Commission was funded through the Parliament's budget rather than the Government's budget, that would be an improvement. Have you any thoughts on that? Um, it's certainly something that we are we're open to, to considering. Um, I think that the Government has... Um, made repeated assurances um, to, to Parliament that we would ensure that, they, that the Fiscal Commission is, is adequately resourced um, to, to fulfil its functions and obviously it would be subject to 
scrutiny in the normal way through the draft budget process in terms of, of our spending proposals. Um, we have also, there's some reference in the, in the policy memorandum, we've spoken to the Commission about ways, sort of administrative arrangements that we might be able to put in place, um, which would provide um, longer term certainty to the Commission over its, its resource allocation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark, to be followed by Richard. Uh, th thank you, convener. Just a, a couple of questions, because some of the ones I was going to raise have been asked already. One of the, uh, I, I don't mean to dwell on the forecasting issue, but one of the points that has been raised um, with the committee in relation to the forecasting is that were the Fiscal Commission to produce its own forecasts, it could give rise to a conflict of interest, that being that they would perhaps err in favour of their own forecast and, and the outcomes of that, as opposed to the forecasting that the government had produced. Is that a, it's maybe a question more for the commissioners, but is that a conflict of interest that the government is recognising when it leaves the door open for the commission to produce its own forecasts? Um, I think probably is be, be a question for, for the commission to, to answer. Uh, but one point I would make is that the bill sets out a core function of the Commission as assessing the reasonableness of forecasts put forward um, by the Scottish Ministers um, and the, the Commission will be under a, a, a statutory duty to prepare such reports assessing the reasonableness of the, the Government's forecasts. Okay. Just, just a, uh, one, one more question then, because I think the, the Deputy Convener has, has covered the, the other points I was going to make. And it, it comes into the issue around term uh, periods. I note, um, uh, leaving aside the fixed term element, I note, first of all, that uh, the approval of appointments is by Parliament, but the length of office or the length of term is determined by ministers, and there is no defined term within the legislation. Is there a reason why that's been left open-ended rather than there being a defined term limit in the legislation? Uh, my understanding is this is sort of consistent um, with, with practice in Scottish legislation that we tend not to specify term lengths for, for such appointments on the face of, face of the bill um, and tend to reference the, the code of practice for ministerial appointments um, to public bodies sets out... Um, uh, maximums in, in an administrative way. It's certainly um, something that we would we'd be willing to reflect on um, in, in, bringing for, in reflecting on the, the findings at stage one. I just think perhaps it could give them the, the, the impression that there could be a, a very long term limit given to an appointee, which uh, while Parliament is approving the appointment, Parliament doesn't have the official role in terms of the, the, the term of office that that appointee would have. So it might just be a, a, a means by which that circle could be squared. But I'll leave it for, for further reflection. Thanks, Convener. Thank you, Richard. It's a very brief question in terms of point of clarity in the forecasting issue and resource and I welcome what's been said today in terms of leaving the door open to potential for um, uh, the Commission to undertake forecasting, not least as part of its job in assessing the reasonableness of the government's own forecast. And it's also welcome, as I said to John Mason, that you're willing to look into further information about what resource impact that might have in terms of the Commission, but clearly you, you've been discussing what resource they need now when, when it's first set up. I, I mean, it, has that included any discussion about whether the current resource allocation would allow any of that to take place, any kind of um, uh, commissioning of independent forecasting, or is there an expectation that, in fact, that would require quite some, some quite significant extra resource? Uh, we see that we, we haven't probably specifically address the alternative forecasting point in our in our interactions with the Commission on the financial memorandum. Um, we have been speaking more generally about the, the overall resource envelope and whether the Commission would consider that that would provide them with sufficient and adequate resource to, to discharge their statutory functions. That's helpful. I, mean, I think further information, as Mr Mason requested, would, would be very helpful to the Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, that is concluded questions from the Committee. But... Not necessarily myself, just committee members. The last question I was going to ask, virtually the exact same question for Richard, and a follow-on to that is, uh, you know, why is the budget for the, the Scottish Fiscal Commission substantially higher than that uh, for the, the, the Irish Fiscal Council, given the mandate for the latter is much wider? Uh, I think there are two areas, uh, main areas, where, where there are some difference. I think one is in... Um, relation to the, the remuneration of um, 
members of the Commission. Um, the, the second is really in relation to what we were really trying very hard to avoid in bringing forward the proposals in the financial memorandum um, was to constrain in any way the decisions that the Commission might take about how it wants to organise itself um, as it, it moves to, to a statutory body. And these will all be questions that are considered as part of a transition programme. So what we have done, for example, is we've provided for accommodation costs um, based on commercial rates um, to provide flexibility should the Commission make a decision that it wants to locate, it, locate itself um, in, in such premises. So um, we would see that, that that's not to say that um, the Commission may not make take decisions which uh, may end up costing slightly less than, than those we've provided for in the financial memorandum. Okay, thank you for that. Sticking with the, the Irish um, model, I'm just wondering if you looked at it in terms of the fact that it produces its report a month after the draft budget, uh, the Irish uh, draft budget. Um, did you look at that? Is that something you feel is disadvantageous? It's something that, it's a, I think it just comes back um, to, to this point around the Scottish Government's view of how the Commission can maximise the integrity of the, the Scottish draft budget that's process um, and around um, the, the fact that we see that the, the Deputy First Minister has been very clear that he would not want to take a budget to Parliament that was underpinned by forecasts that were not considered reasonable by, by the Fiscal Commission. So you think the Irish have got it wrong in terms of how they do it? I don't say they've got it wrong. I say we've <laughs> taken forward suggestions that we think suit the Scottish Parliament's um, arrangements. OK, that's fine. Now, one, one final question, actually, before we wind up. I asked you, um, Alison, about um, the principles uh, for effective independent fiscal institutions, which I said, obviously, were in the SPICE uh, report, which we all have. Um, and the, one of those is that in the issue of a clear mandate, um, and what it says, and I quote, is the OECD state that the mandate for IFI should be clearly defined in higher level legislation or clearly stated in primary law. But they go on to then say the principle is met by the SFC Bill's proposal for the Scottish Fiscal Commission in year one, but may not be met if the SFC's remit is expanded via regulations that's subject to affirmative procedure in the future. And I'm just wondering if you uh, comment on why that's the case. I think and on a general point on the, the OECD principles, we say, well, we, we consider that we have we've brought forward a bill which, um, which delivers on all of those principles. We're obviously very interested in hearing any suggestions through stage one um, of, of the bill process as to, to ways in which that could be strengthened. And, and we're certainly open to looking and, and reflecting on those. I think for the, the powers in, in section five um, really do come down to the, the unique situation we're in in Scotland with, in terms of the the process of devolving further fiscal powers. So what we've s sought to do is to get a balance between that, that flexibility um, for Parliament to, to tailor and amend the uh, functions of the Fiscal Commission to reflect an expansion of those powers without recourse to primary legislation. But what we really have sought to do is to um, entrench the, the core functions, so entrench the the requirement for the Commission to prepare a report assessing the reasonableness of the Scottish Government's assessment of, although then the, the specific factors in A to D could be subject to review, and also entrenching um, the power of the Fiscal Commission to prepare reports on such other fiscal factors as it considers um, appropriate, um, so that they would require primary legislation to remove those. So we have sought as far as we can to strike a balance um, between providing as much certainty um, over the, the functions of the Commission as we possibly can in primary legislation, but still leave that flexibility to take account of um, the, the devolution which is ongoing and which may come in the future. Okay, thank you. Now, I did say that was my final question, but I was only kidding on. There was another one. And it's on the, the uh, independence of the, financial, uh, the, the Fiscal Commission. This is the last question, really. It's on institutional capture. And basically, the SFC currently is a staff member seconded from the Scottish Government. Now, there have been issues raised, not least by ICAS, about the closeness of the Scottish Government to the Scottish Fiscal Commission. And if we're looking at a body that's not only independent, but has to be seen to be independent, surely uh, it doesn't really help if you've got a Scottish Government officials being effectively seconded to that organisation if they're providing scrutiny of the, Scot the, of the Scottish Government. Um, <clears throat> 
probably answer that. Um, it, it, we should be absolutely clear this was only an interim arrangement. This is not a established arrangement that will continue on um, and and the member of staff obviously is very clearly set sight in the letter it doesn't have anything to do with with uh, the forecasting um, it was more around thinking about transition to move to a from a non to a statutory body um, so that's the the, the kind of uh, key area uh, that the staff's working in and also ensuring that the systems are in place um, to um, in line with the requirements outlined in the the the, the framework agreement, so it's it's a it's a, a process and a um, kind of a transition area. It's nothing whatsoever to do with with any of the forecasting, and it is only an interim arrangement. This is not going to be a, a long established arrangement. It, it, it will come to an end, and and it'll be up to the commission themselves to determine the staffing and skills and resources that they need going forward within the envelope that's provided within the financial memorandum. Well, thank you very much for that. That has now concluded my and the committee's questions. Uh, are there any further points you want to make before we wind up the session? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time and for answering our question this morning. Thank you. I'm going to call a recess uh, to allow members a natural break uh, and a change of witnesses until 11.15.
My business is to take evidence on the Scottish Rate of Income Tax from HMRC officials. We are joined today once again by Edward Troop and Sarah Walker. I would like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Mr Troop to make a short opening statement. Edward. Um, thank you very much, convener. It is very good to um, be here again and I am uh, very happy to be able to update the committee on, on the work on the Scottish Rate. And, and the good news is, as you will have seen from the memorandum which we have submitted, um, is that we are on track to implement the Scottish rate on time and within and indeed a little bit below the original budget. Um, you know that the um, main activity now is, at the moment, is uh, communications and identification uh, of uh, Scottish taxpayers um, and uh, making sure that employers uh, have a good level of awareness of uh, their obligations and, and what the Scottish rate will involve. Uh, and we've had good uh, communications with employers, with payroll software companies, with pension providers and with professional bodies. Um, we've already put out uh, the specifications and guidance for software developers and put a lot of information about the Scottish rate online. Um, and this week we have published on gov.uk uh, the UK government website uh, guidance for, for Scottish taxpayers. Um, we're going to write um, later in the year, we haven't quite f fixed the date, but probably in, in December, uh, to all the taxpayers who we believe uh, are Scottish residents based on their tax on their postcode, and that's about slightly over two and a half million, and that will give those individuals an opportunity to correct their address details um, if, for instance, they've recently moved um, from Scotland uh, and, and are elsewhere, or they have recently moved to uh, Scotland and become aware of the need to uh, identify themselves. Um, we are doing, and we will do, continue to do, um, a series of checks of the uh, addresses we hold on our own systems against a range of databases to give us a high, as high a level of confidence as possible that we've correctly identified those people um, who are likely to be Scottish taxpayers. Um, internally, uh, our first IT relief, uh, release, uh, which is uh, linked to that identification of Scottish taxpayers on our system, has gone smoothly, and we have no reported problems from that. Um, the next round uh, of IT internally uh, implementing the PAYE changes on our systems is, is on schedule. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, um, the estimate for the costs uh, of implementation remains a uh, set up costs of 30 to 35 million pounds against an original estimate of 40 to 45 million. Um, that's the progress on Scottish rate. Of course, we are very conscious that the Smith Commission uh, proposals are, are coming down the track with the Scotland Bill, um, and we are staying engaged with that, um, and uh, we expect to be able to implement. Uh, the changes proposed there uh, on the timetable, anticipated timetable uh, for Smith. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, opening statement. And as you'll uh, know from <coughs> previous uh, uh, visits to the committee, I'll start with a few opening questions and then we'll uh, other colleagues in uh, from around the table. Some have already got their names down to get in nice and early. So. Anyway, so first uh, question is, um, you, you've talked about uh, in your opening statement and also in Section 4 of um, Annex A that uh, HMRC has been carrying out a comprehensive programme of communications activities such as publishing written material on gov.uk featuring detailed articles about the SRIT implications, and you actually uh, touched on that in your opening statement. Does, what, what kind of, how many folk actually look at gov.uk? Is that something which is... Uh, uh, looked at by many taxpayers? It, it, is, it is heavily used. I don't have any figures for overall gov.uk um, usage. Um, it, it's obviously there not so much as a, an active communication, but as a resource uh, for individuals who become aware of a particular issue or have got um, questions about a particular issue um, and, and want more information. So it's not the primary source of telling people about their uh, obligations proactively, but it is the source uh, as awareness of Scottish rate becomes uh, more widespread uh, where people can go. And, and we believe that it's a natural place that people now go, uh, and most of the search engines uh, on topics related to 
uh, government business will take you as the top hit to gov.uk. So it, it's there at, as a very important core source of information. Now, in paragraph eight, thank you. In paragraph eight, you talk about in around 85% of cases HMRC held an address for tax, but it could be matched against an address held elsewhere. Um, and then you go on to detail how you could uh, um, identify other Scottish taxpayers. And you say about 98% of the taxpayers for HMRC hold Scottish address are correctly identified as likely to be Scottish taxpayers. And then in paragraph nine, you go on to talk about um, uh, your plans, as you've again touched on, to uh, write to those for whom you hold a Scottish address in December. And I'm just wondering what um, is being done to raise awareness in the rest of the United Kingdom, because quite clearly there may be an issue of people who have addresses on both sides of the border, and those who uh, may have an address may have an address on the other side of the border. Is, is there any uh, uh, work being done to try and? Um, uh, remind customers of the importance of notifying HMRC when they move house south of the border. So, for example, if someone is going to move from England to Scotland or from Wales, whatever, is there anything being done uh, to, to, uh, on that on that scope? Side? There, there, there is no obligation to notify HMRC of your address or of your change of address. Yes. As I think I, I um, discussed with the committee last time I was here. Um, so we are, are relying on other data sources and our own data sources when individuals become resident. Um, typically, of course, with an employee, uh, the employer and the payroll system and hence the PAYE records will record uh, a change of address, as indeed happens now if someone moves into the UK from elsewhere. There's no obligation for them to tell us their address in the UK, but a payroll system will pick up the fact that they have a UK address and uh, they will become part of PAYE. And the same um, system will apply here. Um, we are not, um, in a sense, really on a value for money basis proposing to do a marketing campaign in the rest of the UK uh, to tell people, you know, if they are moving to Scotland, they will need to do this. Um, I think we estimate something like 2.3% of the Scottish population turns over in any year, I moves in and out of Scotland to the UK um, or elsewhere, which is a relatively small number against the totality of, of the Scottish population. But, but Sarah, um, who, who is here, who's responsible for the operational work, um, may have something else to say about the UK uh, addresses. Yes, I mean, because uh, the Scottish rate depends on where your main residence is, the important thing is to, to pick up people who move into Scotland and become Scottish residents. We are looking um, later this year to um, do some targeted publicity around things like the Zoopla website, which are where people who are moving house generally tend to be looking at. Um, there will be other um, specific targeted bits of, bits of advertising which will try and pick up those types of people. Um, so uh, we are uh, actively trying to, as well as using the sources of information which um, Edward is talking about, we're also trying to contact estate agents so that they can r remind people and solicitors when they move into Scotland, remind people of the need to make sure that we know their, their change of residence. Um, apart, as far as the rest of the UK is concerned, we do need to uh, contact and, and inform employers across the whole of the UK because an employer anywhere in the UK may encounter somebody with a Scottish tax code if they have, for instance, just recently moved out of Scotland. And so our communications with employers and payroll operators are on a UK-wide basis, but the uh, communications with taxpayers themselves will be focused on people in Scotland. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of, of, of you know, t contacting every person in the UK <coughs> and letting them know. It's just that if obviously people are getting their tax returns, you know, a sentence could say, if you're moving to Scotland, please blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I, but I, I, I'm pleased that you're doing uh, some proactive work in terms of state agents, and et cetera, as you've, as you've said. But would that be a helpful suggestion? Just, you know, if, if you get, Scotland's got a new tax system. If you're moving to Scotland, please notify us or... Um, well, well, first of all, of course, remember that, uh, that the majority of people don't fill in tax returns because their tax affairs are dealt with under PAYE. The mm. self-assessment return will have a box on are you a Scottish taxpayer. So in a sense, there's that 
an implicit reminder. So if you're okay. about to go to Scotland or you've moved to Scotland, you, you will be, in a sense, prompted because you'll see a question about being a Scottish taxpayer and, and that will then lead you, if you're doing it online or, or through the guidance, to the questions of, you know, can I answer yes, should I answer yes or no to that question? So I think there will be, uh, you know, sufficient prompts within the SA return for people who fill it in properly, which most people do, uh, to, to, to capture those people. The, you know, the initial challenge is just making sure that the starting database is as accurate as possible. OK, and just uh, thanks for that. And, and in paragraph 12, you said HMRC has also worked with the Scottish Government on the possibility of being able to access address information from NHS Scotland records. Um, what, given what you've said already and the other source of information, what will this actually uh, add? Well, uh, I, 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 so the background to this is that we have our own uh, database records which indicate uh, individuals' addresses, um, but we cannot be certain those are accurate. You, you quoted the figure that we've got, we're now to 98% confidence. Um, as with any large data sets, the best way of improving them is to compare them to other data sets. So we've been using other commercially available data sets, electoral register from the, the, the published register, information on postcodes address, information from the Royal Mail. Um, th that has helped us improve and is helping us improve the accuracy of our, our, our data set. If we were to have access to the NHS Scotland data set, that would be yet another uh, data set against which we could check our own records and would no doubt uh, improve the accuracy even further. But it's not a, an essential part of our checking and says none of the individual data sets are uh, essential. They all contribute to just a greater level of accuracy and confidence in, in the, the addresses and names that we've got. Yeah, can I build on Bruce's approach? Uh, but, well, yeah. yes. I mean, you know, as I say, with, with very large data sets like this, you know, two and a half million people, we are never going to be 100% accurate. I mean, that is just the reality. Apart from anything else, as, as I've said, people come and go, and there are taxpayers who, one way or another, manage to stay off our radar. So it is just a, a matter of always looking for additional ways to improve the accuracy of, of our knowledge and information about the taxpayer population. OK, thank you. Now, in paragraph 17, you've said if the Scottish rates diverge from the rates which apply elsewhere in the UK, there'll be an incentive for taxpayers to claim that they live on one side of the border. You know, what kind of differential do you think this would start to have an impact? 1%, 2%, um, 3%, 4%, well, 5 uh, I, I, mean, uh, I, I think human nature is such that uh, any amount of tax saving always it creates the, you know, the inclination of individuals to, to ask themselves the question, is there some way I could, could not pay that? Uh, that's the sort of nature of, of tax raising. Um, I think the... You know, our experience, obviously, is that the higher the differential rate uh, and, and the ease with which it's possible to, uh, you know, make the changes to exploit that differential, you know, will contribute to the number of, of people who, 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 who change. And, and, you know, there have been changes, deliberate changes of rate, like when we cut the duty on un unleaded fuel to try and encourage people to, to change. And it was very easy to change. You just picked up a different... Uh, nozzle at the pump and people um, didn't avoid tax, they saved tax by, by making a choice. But if you have to move your family lock, stock and barrel from uh, Scotland to England or vice versa, that's a slightly more, um, you know, life-changing uh, event. And it's going to take quite a strong differential uh, to encourage people to move entirely for tax reasons. But, of course, you know, if you're buying uh, a house near the border... You know, it may be that it's a, one of the factors which, you know, along with the stamp duty rates and everything else, which will determine which side of the border you want to want to live. But you've no kind of, you know, X Y kind of <laughs> graph at which you know it becomes, you know, where, where the majority of people would change their behaviour one way. Because we've just been the Basque country, and it's quite interesting the information we got with the finance minister. They they say they've. As far as they're concerned, there doesn't seem to be any impact at all on the, in terms of the differential uh, in taxation from, from that part of Spain to the rest of Iberia, and even though there's, there's quite a significant um, uh, tax differential. So I'm just wondering, you know, where it becomes... You know, you know what I'm saying is you've got, you, you raise tax to a level and it, it falls such that it actually becomes detrimental to the overall tax take in the economy. I mean, I think our experience has been with the wider tax system that those individuals who do change their behaviour for tax tend to be those who have got most to, get, to gain, and they are 
obviously the better off, um, and it is the, the levels of tax applying to the, the wealthy which are most likely to result in a behaviour effect. I mean, just as a you know, factual matter, they often have more than one home anyway, and it's a lot easier to just say, well, I'm going to spend seven months in my London home and five months in my Edinburgh home, rather than vice versa, than for someone who has, has one home and all their friends and connections you know, somewhere in Glasgow, and uh, it would be slightly more disruptive to have to move south of the border. So I think, uh, you know, if I had to uh, conjecture, I'd say that for the overwhelming majority of the population, uh, you know, the sort of differential of tax rates which is likely to... Um, you know, come about is, 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 as the Basque experience appears to have been, to be, uh, have almost negligible effect, but uh, to the extent that uh, there are significant differentials for the better off, then that is where we would expect to see, and we would probably be looking to, you know, ask compliance questions uh, about, you know, we expect to see the greater behaviour. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. Just one final question before I open up to committee, and it's, uh, because I know everyone's going to be asking, wanting to ask about this, so I thought I'd be again. First, it's the traffic light system. <laughs> and I look at them and go, oh, I want to ask that. Uh, so I just wonder if you can talk us uh, through some of the uh, issues here, particularly in terms of the, the ambers <coughs> and reds. Uh, the, the, the red, amber, green traffic light system is, is a, a well-used you know, used tool in mm. risk um, management. But... Um, in simplifying things in order to present, as it were, hot spots, it risks Indeed. oversimplifying, yeah. and, and risk management is an extremely complex business. It's complex because before you even start, you need to think of all risks in two dimensions. What's the likely impact of the risk arising? Um, you know, HMRC systems fail completely, massive impact. Um, what's the probability of that arising? Well, actually very low. Uh, what's the probability of us not having 100% names uh, accurate on our register? Actually, it's uh, pretty high because we almost certainly won't have 100% accurate. What's the impact? Actually, it's relatively low. And so you, before you even start, we need to look at risks against those two um, uh, axes. Um, and, and then we have the, the element of time because these are tools... Um, uh, which you know should be used practically to help inform where we put our attention to keep the project on track. Um, last time I was here, the the red um, uh, risk or the red rated risk was about the identification of, of Scottish taxpayers, which we've just discussed. Not because we thought that actually it wasn't going to happen, but because it was a relatively high impact um, part of this. Uh, project, and at that point we had not taken the steps which we have since taken uh, to make sure that we had a high level of confidence about identification. So it was right that it was red last time. Um, I'm pleased that it's not red um, this time. Um, the, the the one we have um, red uh, at, at the moment, and and that's you know um, in part because actually we have very little control over it. Um, is that we do have to, we, is the notification letter um, which we uh, will send to um, taxpayers or who we think are taxpayers um, in, in December, as I've said. Now, what you will see about that is that we are concerned that we have not got certainty on when we're going to send that. Um, now, in part, that's because we are not yet uh, clear of the timing of the Scottish budget. And when the Scottish budget is and the timing of the letter relative to the Scottish budget does uh, impact on its content. Um, we, as you can see, we are forecasting that this will risk will come down because we are expecting uh, that you will announce the state of your budget. And if you have any news on that, I'd be you know, delighted to, to hear it. Um, and once we know the date of your budget, we will be able to determine uh, when we can send the letter and obviously with the knowledge of the date of the budget, whether we will be able to say what rate has been fixed for the Scottish rate. So uh, that is the risk um, that we are concerned about at the moment. But um, while we have very little control over when you set the date of your budget and hence the timing of these letters, we are confident that uh, we'll be able to deliver uh, on that. Um, so I mean, perhaps I should pause there because there are quite a lot of ambers and uh, uh, we might want to you know, pick up some of the amber risks at the same 
go into any of these other indicators as colleagues may wish to do so. But just on that last one in terms of the budget, understanding it, obviously the spend review is on the 25th of November, as you'll know, and I think our budget's later to come out the first week of January. Um, I don't know if you're still intending to send out letters in December. <coughs> Some of them might get lost in the, the kind of Christmas uh, rush of mail. People might not notice, take, notice them as much. I don't know if they will or not. Um, but uh, I certainly think that first week of January is most likely for our, for our budget. Uh, I'll leave it at that to allow our colleagues to ask uh, their questions. And the uh, first person to ask a question will be John, to followed by Jackie. Thank you, Peter. Um, I saw in paragraph uh, three of your report that um, you, you were saying that you know employers would already be familiar with the Scottish variable rate. I mean, I think we've had some evidence to say that um, employers are not very, were not very familiar with that and just kind of assumed that there would be no changes and are maybe assuming again that there would be no changes. Is that a, serious, is that a consideration? I mean, are, are employers really as aware as...? I, I'll, I'll let Sarah add, add more details, but I've, first of all, I, I would just pick up that the paragraph 3 doesn't say that the employers were fam are familiar with the Scottish variable rate, but that because the Scottish variable rate was on the statute book, the functionality needed for it is built into most payroll systems. Right. Um, uh, but actually what we have found, uh, and we have held a recent uh, conference for payroll uh, providers, was that there is actually a very high la level of awareness of the uh, you know, forthcoming Scottish rate. So the combination of there being functionality in payroll systems and uh, for the Scottish variable rate, which you know, effectively uh, transposes into the Scottish rate um, and what appears to be a good level of awareness amongst payroll um, operators and software providers gives us a, a level of confidence here. But, Sarah, do you want to sort of say anything more about our engagement with the payroll providers and software yeah. people? Yes. Um, I think the vast majority of, of employers will use some sort of proprietary accounting system that runs their payroll, like Sage or something like that. And those those systems will have had the functionality for Scottish variable rate built in. That is, uh, will allow them to distinguish a code with an S on it, which is going to be a Scottish code, and would allow them to, on, when they get one of those codes, to operate a different tax calculation. And that's basically all we're asking people to do now. Um, as Edward said at the recent um, conference of payroll operators, um, that we held a session on uh, the Scottish rate um, they asked for the person doing it asked for a show of hands around the room of people who were aware that it was coming and practically everybody put their hand up so I think we are confident that the payroll industry is ready for this um, but part of the um, new information we've put on to the internet this week is quite a bit of guidance for employers as to how it works a lot of this is I think reassurance to them that actually that we're not asking them to do anything complicated we're not asking them to form a judgment based on their employer, employees address whether they're a Scottish taxpayer or not it's something that they're very well used to. They receive a particular sort of tax code to us. They feed that into their payroll system and the right result ensues. And I think that's the reassurance that we're giving to employers. Thank you. Um, in paragraph five, you talk about guidance for customers uh, and elsewhere you talk about taxpayers. Is, is, is that different? Is customers different or? No, that's uh, customers are taxpayers and our taxpayers are our customers. Right. I do prefer taxpayers myself, so that's okay. Right. Um, we, we talked about a, you know, how many, you've got 98% certainty and 85% um, of cases HMRC held an address for a taxpayer. I mean, I mean, you've also touched on the fact that the higher risk people are probably the people who are better off and might have more than one property. Are you particularly targeting them to pin down where they're resident? Um, I, I'm not aware that we are particularly targeting them at the moment. Um, uh, you know, the high rate, obviously, of people will tend to fill in self-assessment returns. In fact, they almost universally will. So we are likely to have more information than for what I might call an average PAYE uh, payer where our only contact is likely to be through his or her employer. But, um, Sarah, do you want to say anything about the um, higher rate? Well, our, we have a uh, high net worth um, unit that looks after some of the very high uh, wealthy taxpayers. Um, they are very much involved in this. They will have a sort of customer relationship, manager relationship with their taxpayers, so they should know quite a lot about them and should know where their, address, that, 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 that where their up-to-date address is. Um, 
and they are looking at whether there is more we ought to be doing around picking up risks in relation to those people, particularly if there is a different rate, as Edward spoke, spoke about earlier. Um, but generally, and again, with the self-assessment uh, taxpayers who, again, the, the higher, higher income people tend to be in self-assessment, they will be asked directly after the end of the year to say whether they lived in Scotland for, the, for, the, for most of the year or not. And so there is a positive return required from those people. And, and how much is the, is the trust required in this? Because in paragraph 9 it says, uh, important to confirm which of these addresses held as their main place of residence, and in paragraph 13 it talks about taxpayers already able to amend their address uh, using gov.uk. I mean, that suggests it's actually quite easy to change your address. Well, it, it is quite easy to change your address, and it's quite easy to fill in a tax return and put false figures on it. But um, generally, this isn't a good thing to do because, you know, our compliance work is quite effective um, because we do resource to risk. So I, I think... Um, we are not that worried about people putting false information on um, because I think particularly for the better off they're aware of the consequences. I think the concern here is just making sure that we have got within an, our net everybody you know, who ought to be there and it's more likely to be you know, lack of awareness uh, which trips people up than, than deliberate uh, misstatement of their position. I mean, there will be people, I'm sure, who have homes in London and Edinburgh. Uh, in fact, I was talking to somebody who's a director of a Scottish company and she lives in London, she's Scottish. She was rather upset to hear that she only spends a month or two up here and uh, she's not going to be a Scottish taxpayer because she quite wanted to be. Um, I don't know whether that's because she thought uh, there was going to be a cut in the rate. Uh, so there clearly are people in, in that category, but, you know, they, they will be people, A, who fill in self-assessment returns and have to answer a, an actual you know, question, you know, are you a Scottish taxpayer, taking these factors into account. Um, you know, and they are likely to be the better off who you know, generally are more compliant. I think it's okay. also worth saying that um, we do expect to repeat the sort of comparisons of our address database with external data sets um, in the future. So um, if uh, somebody is... is giving us a misleading or wrong uh, address for, for us, we will be able to check it, whether that matches the addresses they, they, that they've given to other people and what they're, where they're registered to vote and those sorts of things. OK. I, I think somebody's trying to work out where this noise is coming from. Um, it's not me. Paragraph, yeah, that's okay. paragraph 11 it talks about the scan has produced a list of individuals for whom HMRC holds an address elsewhere in the UK. Can, can you give us an idea how long that list is? How many people are on it? It's roughly 20,000. Okay, so it's a fair number of people. Well, I, it, it, that's a fair number of people, but that's less than 0.1% of the uh, total number on the list. Or is that 1%? That's no, 0.1%. Right. So I'm trying to do my arithmetic in my head. No, I think it's, point, I think it's 1%. Okay, and uh, my final point, uh, in paragraph 20, uh, it talks about uh, the running costs are estimated to be 2 2.5 million if SRIT is at 10% but it would be 5.5 to 6 million if it's not 10%. I mean, I was quite stunned, actually, that that's two or three times more, even if we only changed the rate by 1%. Well, and, and Sarah can give you even more details, but um, the, uh, what I have described, or Sarah and I have described, which is the identific identification of the taxpayers, keeping the taxpayer base up to date, making sure that employers um, are... are operating the payroll is in a sense the, the baseline and the steady state and until such point as as the Scottish rate changes from from 10 percent nothing more is needed because there will be no difference in the payments or collections uh, the, the codes effectively will be exactly the same for Scottish um, and non-Scottish taxpayers uh, and, and, and and everything will continue uh, smoothly um, as soon as the rate changes at that point obviously uh, different codes have to apply for Scottish and uh, non-Scottish taxpayers, which itself is a, is a coding exercise. And then there will be both differential payments made, which we will need to ensure we apply compliance to so that the correct amount is collected in the different cases. And there will be queries and contact uh, um, issues from taxpayers who, whose tax bill changes and who get on the phone to HMRC to ask what's going on or, who's in, or 
creates issues for their employers who themselves have to contact us. So as soon as the rate changes in either direction, there will be both uh, an increase in, in actual activity within the system and consequential activity of contact with us, all of which uh, take a, a level of activity which is relatively low and steady, you know, up to quite a significantly different label, level. And, and so I don't know if you want to sort of amplify on the, the actual things which uh, will be different if we... I think, I think Edward's covered the main things. Um, the, res the customer... So the market research that we've done recently on um, uh, attitudes to the Scottish rate make it clear that people are much more likely to phone us up or uh, make, raise queries over their income tax if the rate is different than if the rate is the same where that, that it makes no difference to the amount of tax they're paying. The UK raised its rate by 1% from 20 to 21. That, that would just really go through very smoothly because it would just be slotting a different figure into people, payroll providers, wouldn't it? Is it because we're doing it through the code rather than through the rate that uh, that, that creates more of a problem? No, I don't think so. That, no. I mean, that will, create, that will create questions as well, but... Um, yeah, if, if the UK rate changed, then there would be a, a, a similar sort of extra administrative cost right. um, because we'd have to change people's PAYE codes. The people are more likely to phone us up and ask, ask what's going on. So I think this sort of um, uh, cost would, would certainly be similar if, if there was a UK-wide change in the basic rate. Sorry, but somebody's code wouldn't change if you changed the tax rate, would it? It can do. It can do because some uh, items are coded out, if you like, in, it, not everybody's code does, but some people where there is an amount of, uh, there is an adjustment to your tax code to, re, to recover a, a precise amount right, of okay, tax, right, okay, right, that right. has to be different depending on the marginal rate that's assumed. And typically that would be, you know, benefits in kind, which we were notified at the end of the year, which would give rise to a tax charge for the previous year, which we then need to recover through the tax coding for the following year, and that tax tax coding has to be adjusted to reflect what the rate is at which we would then be collecting that amount of benefit in kind charge, which is obviously the rate for the, the second or third year. Uh, and, and that's where uh, the actual coding change would depend on the status of the taxpayer if there was a different rate in Scotland. The PAYE system is very effective <coughs> at avoiding having to um, issue self-assessment returns to 30 million people, but it means it is quite complicated internally uh, precisely because it achieves uh, the right amount through the coding system. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jackie. To be followed by Jean. Um, yeah, can I return to, because I, I love colours on a chart that's just wonderfully <laughs> simple. Um, can I return to the highest risk identified? Because um, the convener was right, you're, you're unlikely to be issuing a letter in December, but I fear that you won't be issuing the letter until you have certainty over the Scottish rate of tax, um, and that's not going to be February when, until the budget actually passes. Now, that being the case, do you think there is a significant risk of pressure on, on your service in terms of a huge number of inquiries in a very short period of time? Because you're talking February to implementation, and I absolutely agree with the point that Mrs Walker made. Um, employers are very well aware of this. You know, your communications in terms of payroll have been very good, but they are champing at the bit to tell their employees, and they don't know what to tell them. So, you know, I don't know if there's a stage before that that you could use these people to put out key messages about what the Scottish rate of income tax is all about, and then actually you then follow up in February with a letter explaining that and the rate. Um, look, first of all, can I just sort of um, pick up one thing there, which is we, ha we are not necessarily going to leave the letters until after the Scottish budget. We want to know when the Scottish budget is going to be. Um, uh, so it may well be that we feel the right thing to do is to issue these letters in December, um, saying that this is what is happening. Uh, there will be a Scottish budget and it may set a different rate and we are writing you to you to uh, because we think you're a Scottish taxpayer. If you are a Scottish taxpayer, the letter is going to go out of its way to say you don't need to do anything, please don't ring us up. Uh, but if you think for any reason you're not a Scottish taxpayer because uh, despite the fact of us writing you at a Scottish address, this isn't your main residence, either it's been forwarded to you because you've just moved or actually this is a holiday home and you just happen to use the address for convenience purposes or whatever it is. Um, we could still and we may well send those letters in December. 
our feeling is that if the Scottish budget were in December, and you're sort of more or less telling me that it's not going to be in December, then there would be a greater level of awareness and sending those letters around the same time might have a you know, higher level of impact uh, than if, that if the budget was not there. Equally, as you rightly point out, um, if we leave this until February, uh, then it is very close to the implementation date. Uh, it also runs into, for us, the self-assessment peak, which is the 31st of December and uh, 31st of January, and could create significant pressures on our call centres. So we are hoping now that the Parliament has been reconvened that we will get certainty over the date soon, and we will then quite quickly make a decision about sending the letters. I would say my expectation remains that we will send them out in early December, but we have not yet uh, finally agreed that. Um, I think it's helpful. We, we are a bit in the dark as well as to exactly when it will be. The budget process will start, we reckon, in early December, but it won't finish and you won't have a rate absolutely confirmed until February. So you could still exercise your judgment of you know, maximising impact on, on that basis. Um, can I ask you about advertising? Okay, because we know about the Scottish rate of income tax, but when I ask people in my own community, they haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. Um, so on that basis, what's your approach more widely than simply a letter? Um, how much money are you spending on it and where are you spending it? Um, right, I'll, I'll let Sarah fill in some of the details again, but I would sort of make the overarching point that our responsibility is to make sure that this tax is administered effectively. Um, obviously, you know, we are happy to support um, any um, wider messaging about the tax, but it is not our role to raise awareness per se. We, what we need to do is to make sure that we have the correct, uh, the most accurate set of information possible in order to administer the tax um, properly, which, which means in terms of both value for money and direct effectiveness, um, HMRC and hence you paying for some billboard campaign up and down the length of of, of uh, Scotland uh, is not probably the right thing to do because we already believe we're at about 98% accuracy and therefore writing to, to those people we think are Scottish taxpayers using other soft means uh, by which I mean you know promoted articles, conferences, um, going through the professional community, going through the estate agent community, going through some of the uh, you know, more interesting professions in terms of mobility, like the offshore workers, you know, like the fishing industry, like students, um, actually is going to be more effective to us, for us, than going out with a wide advertising campaign. But we do think that at some stage we will want to do some wider uh, campaigns once we have sent the letters and done what we can through uh, soft uh, communications. And I'll sort of let Sarah um, fill in the details to the extent we have them, of, of what we propose to do in the wider campaigns. Yeah, uh, in terms of the costs uh, that we've allowed for it, in the original budget that we um, uh, shared with the Scottish Government, uh, we had provisionally allowed for quite a substantial advertising campaign because we thought we might need that if we didn't have confidence in our address data. We now do have better confidence in that, um, and we think that a widespread advertising campaign wouldn't represent value for money. That's not because of any constraints on the budget, because it's the Scottish Government's budget. It is simply because we have to take responsibility for what represents good value for money. Um, we do have... I mean, we would expect there to be a lot of interest in the Scottish media and in the press, around the, particularly around the time of the Scottish budget, um, as to what the Scottish rate is and, and, and what the uh, arguments are around whether what, how it should be set. And we would expect to try and sort of build on that to, uh, make, to, to use press interest and to offer information to personal finance pages in newspapers, that kind of thing, to explain how it works. We will be offering uh, material for employers to put in their newsletters. We will be um, using all sorts of um, uh, non-paid for, if you like, communication channels to, to put out that information. We will then, as Edward said, look at targeted uh, paid-for advertising later, as and when we think it, it's necessary, in order to make sure that we've reached any particular audiences that, are, that, that are, we think may have been missed. But uh, again, the, it is the letter itself which is our main means of communication. 
Um, I, I had heard, I confess, that there were constraints in the budget, and what I'm hearing from you now is that the, there is no intention to advertise unless you need to do so um, because you think you're covered. So if I'm sitting at home watching the TV, there's going to be no television adverts, nothing on the radio, nothing of that nature to inform the wider public about this. Um, at the moment, we don't plan to do that. Um, there, as Sarah That's said, and I... And I, I the meeting with some colleagues of ours where I, we got the message back that we had said that we were there were constraints on our budget and that is absolutely not right what we did say is whatever we did we wanted to be driven by value for money uh you know again driven by the uh, likely effectiveness of the actions we take um and at the moment uh you know television advertising or billboards do not look like good value for money uh, in chasing down what we think is going to be a, 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 relative, a very small proportion of the population uh, who we haven't got accurate uh, details for. Okay. Can I just press you on the point of how much you originally planned to spend and how much are you actually spending now? We, we, we quoted originally 4.2 million, um, but that was not all paid for advertising. That was the overall campaign, including sure. the costs of sending letters. Um, I don't think we have revised that. Uh, in sense we haven't, we haven't ourselves got a revised budget, um, and we have not um, uh, you know, shared one with, with you or the Scottish Government. Um, but I think we hope it's going to be significantly less than that. But, but clearly, the, 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 our written communications, our letters, do come with quite a significant cost themselves. So do we have a breakdown on where we are on the four point? We don't have a specific figure for paid-for advertising because uh, we, we are still trying okay. to work out the best targeting for that advertising. Could you supply the committee with the revised figure? Um, I, I, we can tell you where we expect to be at the moment, but as I say, yeah. and, and, and actually the timing of your budget has an impact yeah. because we, you know, we do think that the impact of the letters will be affected uh, by the time of your budget. And that's not to say that if you have a January budget, uh, it won't be as effective because actually that may be a second bite at the cherry because if we sent the letters in December without obviously indication of the rate, and then there's the publicity around your budget. That will be the opportunity to have a, a, a push through the professional and other trade journals and through the um, non-paid-for uh, wider media, you know, through newspaper articles. Okay. And at that point, we will be able to judge how well we're doing and hence you know, what we'd want to spend okay. further paid-for advertising but, on. But we can, give you, no, we can give you a range of you know, where roughly yeah. we think we might be, but it, how helpful that will be. I'm not sure. And the, we have shared with the government an outline, Scottish Government, an outline of the sort of principles of the campaign uh, of sure. communications, which it, you may have seen. Yeah, I think it would be very helpful if uh, the committee could see that. And any information you can provide yeah. on finance, because clearly value for money is something that concerns us too. Um, my final question, convener, um, and again, I'm pro maybe not understanding this table very well, but um, IT projects are notoriously difficult to implement. So, you know, I share, I share um, pleasure at what you're telling us about the initial implementation, um, but also slight concern at the bottom of page seven, um, you talk about project not managing its relationship and dependency with a digital programme. What is that risk and what have you put in place to mitigate it? I'm just trying to tr track through to what you're looking at. Sorry. Um, it, it's, it's the I, I've got a, a, a helpful table. This one, yeah. Bottom of page seven. It's the last item in your risk register. Oh, right. Yes. Um, do you want to say, talk about that? Yeah. Um, we have a major program at the moment of uh, implementing digital services, um, both for personal taxpayers and for business taxpayers. Mm. Um, that is uh, a big preoccupation for the department. Um, we need to make sure that what we're doing for the Scottish rate, which is a slightly more niche project, if you like, is fitting in with that overall uh, overall plan and also making the best use of the new digital services that we're putting in place. So, for instance, um, we are uh, putting in place personal tax accounts for taxpayers who, where they will be able to, in a secure environment, log on to their own records and update their own records online. Um, and clearly that will be a really useful thing for us to use to help people to update their, update their, their, their addresses, but also to see 
how much of their tax is being paid to the Scottish Government and how much is for other UK services. So we want to make use of these um, digital services. We need to make sure that we are well plugged into the work that's going on elsewhere in the department to, to produce those new services for people. Okay. How confident are you that you know, we won't be disadvantaged from accessing those new services? No, no, I think it's, really, it's going really well and I think that's reflected in the fact that um, the, uh, the risk is, is, um, is coming down. Okay. And, and I think, picking up points I've made, I, I think obviously there are always risks uh, in any large system, but, but I think net this is an opportunity and, and, and positive because if personal tax accounts run and we're paying for those, so it's not your cost, it is a real opportunity to actually allow the Scottish taxpayers to access more. They, you can change your address online at the moment, but you can't see your personal tax affairs. You haven't got a personal digital account. And if when we get those operating, I think it will really help uh, the the operation of the of the um, Scottish rate. Great. Thank you both very much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jean. To be followed by Mark. Thank you. Uh, I just want to follow on on the on the theme of communication, possibly with businesses rather than in individual taxpayers. Um, and certainly for the moment, it's not the talk of the STEMI in any of the areas that I represent. And I hear what you say, that you, you believe that there's really good understanding um, with, the, with the payroll managers, the, the SAGE programmes and others that, that do all of that. But I um, am concerned that if we look at the, a lot of the people who are responsible for PAYE systems in Scotland generally, and certainly in the Highlands and Islands, they're very small employers with three or four people. There are people who quite likely are still doing a manual wage system that, you know, SAGE will not be known to them. Um, and I wonder what, you know, what kind of communication we can expect through perhaps some of the business organisations. I mean, we know that the, the Federation of Small Businesses, for example, has a large membership across Scotland um, and other similar trade organisations. How is it better that they deliver the message or are they going to, um, in newsletters and other ways, or will there be a series of workshops with them in order to spread the word? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Sorry, can I, can I step back a, a little bit? I mean, if there is no change to the Scottish rate in the first year, then in a sense we have longer to continue to engage with those employers because they need to do nothing different. Their, their tables will change because they will change with uh, personal allowances, etc. this year. Um, and in a sense it will not you know, be a, a huge issue for them. If there is a, a, a change in the Scottish rate and if the, if the budget, whenever it is, sets a rate different from, from 10p, then I think we can anticipate there will be a huge amount of interest um, from, you know, from individuals, from employees, because they will read that the tax rate has changed and they will want to know uh, what has happened, which is why there are costs for us, because they will ring us up. And at that point, I think all employers... Um, you know, will become extremely aware of the need to have done something. I think that the, we obviously have to, you know, plan for, for both scenarios there, but planning for the change of rate scenario, um, because we have engaged well with the payroll software providers, I think we can be confident that the main point at which those employers who do use software will go to when there, if there's a change of rate, are well taken care of. And so when they, you know, they will be reassured by SAGE or whoever it is um, that, yes, this is taken account of in your software and it'll all be fine. Um, for those who do not, uh, you know, who are still using PAYE manually, and I don't have a, uh, a, a, a figures for that, th they will get communications from us because obviously if they're doing it manually, they will be in communication with us and, and we will make sure that they will get communications which will effectively update their, their tables to reflect where they are. I suspect, um, and this may be you know, wrong, that if you are a small employer in the Highlands and Islands uh, you know, who is doing PAY manually, there isn't really any question about the residence of your employees. I imagine that they will all be Scottish resident employees, relatively local. So you won't have the complexity of having to run, you know, for different employees with different codes, because I would assume those sort of manual employers are likely, and manual payroll operators are likely to have all Scottish employers, and they will have a single set of tables for, for those uh, employees. I'm Sorry, do you want to add to that, Sarah? Just about the communications. I think all, all employers, as I've said, across the whole of the UK have to potentially be able to operate an S Scottish code from this April. Um, 
we communicate with all employers through something called the Employers Bulletin, which goes out regularly. That has had articles in it about Scottish rate and being ready for it. We are speaking to people like the Federation of Small Businesses. We're also talking to the accountancy profession, and I think a lot of small businesses will consult their accountant about their PAYE system and how to operate PAYE. So we're doing everything we can. And as I say, we have put more material onto the um, gov.uk website, which is specifically targeted at employers, so that they can, um, they can, they can use that for reference. Um, so uh, we are trying to use all the communication channels we have to make sure that all employers are, are ready for this. Okay. And maybe I'm missing something, but I can't quite... I, I can understand if the, if, if the, <coughs> the budget, the rate actually changes, that a lot of people will be interested in that, of course, particularly if they're going to pay a higher tax. But the Scottish rate of income tax is just that. It is a separate tax already, whether it's, whether it's 10 pence or 11 pence or 13 pence. And um, it, it's the, there's two things, isn't there? There's the system itself that allows for that. So I, I can't quite see, other than a, an emotional interest in how much tax we pay, what the massive difference is in terms of, of the practical collection of that tax between... 10 pence and 11 pence. And again, would relate back to John Mason, who raised um, the final point on page 6 of the, of the dramatic increase in, in collecting that, because surely the Scottish rate of income tax has got to be identified in your offices. Um, I think that's, that's exactly the point, that if it's not changed from 10p, then the amounts of tax collected will be entirely unchanged because the basic rate of 20p of UK tax will be replaced by 10p of UK tax and 10p of Scottish tax. But the actual amount of 20p in aggregate will remain exactly the same. The employees will have exactly the same deduction, all other things being equal, and the same amount of tax will, will be paid and the employers will effectively do the same thing. The, the, the work that has to be done is done by us because we will have returns um, which include Scottish taxpayers designated by the S code and we will through our systems have to aggregate out how much Scottish tax has actually, Scottish rate has actually been collected as it happens for the first two years because of the transitional arrangements even that doesn't impact on the amount of money that gets adjusted through the block grant and, and paid across, but we will nevertheless be doing those calculations, but that will all be work we do on the basis of the S codes. So for the employer, if the rate does not change from 10p, really nothing changes at all in terms of what they have to do beyond making sure that they've got the designation of S or not S um, on their systems. Um, if it changes, then they will be collecting a different amount because instead of the 20, if the rate goes to 11 or goes down to 9, they will be collecting 21 or 19 and that will actually be a change in the amount of tax which they collect and a change in the amount of deduction which the employee sees. We will still have to do the same work behind the scenes and it's that change, the change from 10p rather than the introduction to the 10p, which is going to cause, you know, I won't say challenges, but it's going to cause interest and activity and questions um, from the uh, employees and from the businesses. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure that I, I still understand the difference of... of I mean, I'm imagining a tax collection in, uh, in the revenue and, you know, bags of money being delivered to Scotland, if you like, just to be practical, just to know, a kind of cartoon sketch. So whether it's 10 pence or 11 pence doesn't seem to make... I, I, I still can't differentiate the costs that you're relating to the collection of that or the differential in, from the employer's point of view. If there's an electronic wages system that's set up to collect a rate of, of, of uh, an S tax and an E tax, uh, for want of a better expression, then regardless, that, presumably that system will work in exactly the same way. It, it, it will do. And if, you, if, you, if we come away from the manual operators back to the electronic, which is the, 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 the bulk of them, the, the majority of the additional cost is going to be about the fact that people will see their tax bills changes changing and that they will be interested in that and will want to know why it's happened and they will have questions. And to be honest, it may not always may not be operated completely correctly in every case, either because people have been misdesignated Scottish taxpayers 
because they've moved house or whatever, and that's going to create activity. So that is where the, where the additional work and the additional burden arises. Because in the example where it doesn't change, it doesn't really matter. I mean, it doesn't matter to us because we do need to know um, whether someone is correctly or incorrectly designated a Scottish taxpayer because the tax burden remains exactly the same on them. Mm. Okay, and we would have the detail of that difference, would we, when the time came? The increase in the cost, presumably we're paying yes, for that. We we will, you know, we have, you know, continued to provide a no, breakdown where, of, of costs. Where that money yeah. was being spent. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just a couple of questions. The first one just follows on on this, the differential um, that was touched on by the Deputy Convener and by, and by Jean Urquhart. I'm just wondering, in terms of those additional costs, were those additional costs to materialise? Are those costs that are simply just going to be absorbed within HMRC? Or I presume there's not, because I haven't seen it mentioned anywhere in the in the paper, it's not going to be through some form of recharge system or anything like that. Additional costs? So, <clears throat> the if, if SRIT were set at a level other than 10%, you've yeah. spoken of the costs uh, going from 2 yeah. to 2.5 two million up to 5.5 to six million pounds. Are those costs simply going to be absorbed within HMRC? No, those, those are the costs costs. which are recharged to you. Those are costs are recharged. I mean, we, we do absorb all the sort of fixed costs of running your HMRC. The costs which are, re, are recharged under the agreement for costs are costs which are specifically identifiable and identified, um, and they're audited uh, and recharged to you. And, and so those additional costs remain the same irrespective of the rate above 10% that is applied? There isn't a kind of sliding scale on the, that? These, these are estimates, but um, uh, so I mean, since it may not be exactly that amount, but, but no, the, the additional cost arises from the change, and whether it's 12, 15, 9 or 6 will not make material difference to what the additional costs are. They okay. will be what they are. This is, this is not a quote, uh, and it's not sort of tax-linked. It's our estimate of the additional activity specifically attributed to servicing Scottish taxpayers and Scottish employers as a result of the Scottish rate change. Okay. Uh, just to turn to the risk register. Um, now, I seem to recall, and, and forgive me because it was a while back that you were last before us, but I seem to recall the last time you came before us with the risk register, I questioned around where, where, where these numbers sat in terms of the probability and impact. Uh, and I think I'd asked for those figures to be, or, or the, those details to be given to the committee. And I just wonder whether that is, again, something you might be willing to do. I think one of the reasons is, is that to look at it in this uh, in this format, um, there are things there which, for example, are showing up as amber and red, which obviously set alarm bells ringing. But when you look at the, the probability or the impact, you actually realise that, you know, certainly in terms of the impact, if it's a low impact, um, it... it, it it becomes less of a concern for people when they look at those figures. So I wonder if that's something you would be able to provide. Um, I, I'm sorry if we failed to, to follow up on something which I um, said I would do last time, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that we... I, I, I could be recalling incorrectly, but um, I do seem to well, remember having the, asked. The, 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 the colour, the red, amber, green, is based on a... Um, a, and which relates to the numbers is, re, is, is based on a grid which effectively has probability and impact. And uh, to be honest, I don't. There's a sort of standard convention for which of the sort of top right corners of that grid you mark red, which ones are amber, and which ones are green. And we can certainly share that grid with you, so you can see against each of the the numbers, you know, how the uh, colouring relates to the probability and impact score that it has. But as I said at the outset of the, the comments on risk, the, you know, giving an, uh, a one of three colours to something as complex as this risks oversimplifying the position quite dramatically. Appreciate that. Um, I also look back on the, uh, Annex B, which gives the sort of last year's report for some of the the matrix. Um, and I note that there hasn't been a whole lot of change. I mean, some of them have changed marginally. Um, the, the, the obvious one is the one that's gone from red to amber, but that's only because of a, a score difference of one. But I, I note that there hasn't been much change over that period, and yet uh, on your forecast, um, most of these are forecast to drop quite substantially in terms, or, 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 or materially in terms of the risk that is, a, that, that is applied. So I just wonder... If there hasn't been any change over that period of time, what, what leads you to assume that those forecasts are going to materialise? Um, Sarah can probably add details, but I, I have a, a list of the risks which have changed or moved since last time. Uh, and 
uh, I've got one, two, three, uh, four, five risks which are not on the list that were on there before. In other words, the confidence that we had last time that the risks were, were coming down and, and the risk would be resolved you know, has been met. We have taken five risks uh, off the risk register. Um, I think there are probably one or two new ones, and Sarah may be able to uh, call those out to me. So this is dynamic the, you know, in the sense that uh, we have been moving broadly, or a bit more than broadly, you know, quite firmly in the direction uh, of improving the management of the risks and, and landing this project. Um, I think it's also worth, it, some of it may be just relate to the stage that the project is at. Um, we're now moving into the point at which some of these risks are likely to either crystallise or not. Um, so what, what's happened over the recent months will be us improving our preparedness for implementation, but um, perhaps not being able to be as uh, to, to form a view as to how, how likely some of these risks are to to improve. Um, we are now moving into the implementation phase, and that will start to change pretty quickly. I think. Um, uh, yes, there are some risks that have changed from the old one to the new one. There are some new risks that have arisen, for instance, the one about the timing of the Scottish budget, which, is, which has come in. So it is, a, it is definitely a, a dynamic document. Yeah. I mean, if I can just pick one, for, for example, the, one, uh, the third one, uh, there is a risk that the project does not keep abreast of wider transformational change, which could result in the solution not sitting within the HMRC operating model circa 2016. If I look back to the 2014 figures that you've given us, it was showing up as a risk of 13 on the amber scale. It's now showing up as 14 on the amber scale, which I appreciate is probably a marginal uh, change, but I don't know whether that relates to an increased probability or an increased impact. And yet, um, the forecast is that that's going to be A-OK. -okay. It's going to be green uh, by the end of this process. And I'm just wondering... Well, I think what leads you to that conclusion when there doesn't well there does appear to have been movement, but it appears to have been an increase on the risk rather than a decrease. Uh, the the increase in the risk in, in part is around the fact that we have a spending review and that we our own finances and the the, the operating model for HMRC in a sense is always up for review at spending review, and I think there has been increased uncertainty over the course of the last six or seven months about about our operating model and about the structure of the department going forward. Um, you know, I, I remain confident that actually the spending review will come out in a way which gives us a sustainable and stable um, transformation model uh, which will bring this risk down. But until the spending review is out there, till we've settled our own internal um, budgets for our transformation and plans for the next five years, or at least the next three years, I can't be certain of that. So it remains here. It has been... It has been a bit more worrying over the course of the year because of the uncertainty around the spending review, um, but I remain confident that it will come down on the right trajectory. But, I mean, that, I think, just teases out the, some of the uh, difficulties and subtleties within the, these risks. I, I, in a sense, I, I think it's good to have the challenge on it, but what I, I would say what's important to me as the accountable officer within the department is that... Uh, the risk register is maintained, and it, it, each I feel each of these risks are being actively managed. And obviously, if we have red ones, I worry about them. But my concern is more to know that there is someone in Sarah's team or in the delivery teams who is actually on top of the individual risks and, and driving them down, which I'm satisfied they are. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and I think from from my perspective, getting that further and that sort of deeper information would, would allow me to see the sort of probability versus impact. The only other question I had was around the control effectiveness. Um, I note that I assume the very low uh, on the uh, the timing of the letter is because of the fact that it is determined by the timing of the Scottish Government budget, which is not something you have control over. Um, I just wondered, in terms of the moderate, is that is that based on there being factors out with your control, but some are within your control? Um, yes. Yes, sorry, I'm just looking at the ones that are moderate. Yes, absolutely. Okay, no problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Richard? Um, obviously, in terms of ensuring there's a smooth tra transition with um, SRIT, it's important there's the, the right exchange of data and ease of exchange of data between uh, yourselves and the Scottish Government uh, and, and an official level in particular. How are you ensuring that that takes place? How often are you meeting? What discussion channels do you have? Uh, are you satisfied you've got all the data you need and there's a willingness there to cooperate? And, and is, that, is that reciprocated? Are you confident that's being reciprocated? 
We, we have a very good relationship with uh, Revenue Scotland and with Scottish Government, and I'm, indeed I'm going to see them uh, this afternoon, as I generally do when I come up here. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that in terms of running the SRIT, which is you know tax which is uh, a devolved tax but which is administered by HMRC, that actually we are dependent uh, on uh, Scottish Government for a uh, huge, huge amount of data exchange, but Sarah may correct me. No, you, the NHS records you mentioned. Yes, so things like the, the, the time scale of the of the budget. There may be issues that too that they oh, wish to. Yeah, yeah. So more, yes, and so those. Well, we've sort of covered both of those. <laughs> they're slightly different. The the NHS data. I mean, obviously, in that respect, Scottish government, like any other data set holder, we go yeah. around and say, can we share? Have a look at your data. It'll help us. Um, and you know, we haven't we haven't used that in that case. And uh, I don't think that's a reflection of, of, of not good relations. Obviously, the timing of the budget is the timing of the budget. But it, but in terms of, of working closely and sharing, you know, our our proposals for um, um, publicity around this, you know, we do that all the time. And, and obviously, we've been close in touch with them on the devolution of the other two taxes, which you've already taken control of. Um. I think in terms of uh, regular contact, um, the Scottish Government is re represented on, in a formal sense, on our programme and project boards, which meet monthly. Um, but also, um, I will speak to Sean Neill, who was in, in here uh, previously this morning. Um, I will speak to him at, at least fortnightly. We have a, we have a formal catch-up fortnightly, and often more, more frequently than that. Um, we have a very open... Um, dialogue. Uh, I'm very happy with the cooperation and the the help that we're getting uh, from the Scottish Government. I mean, for instance, around communications, um, it is important for us to be c coordinating the messages that we're giving around the Scottish rate with any other sort of uh, publicity or um, communication the Scottish Government is carrying out. There is a chance that the uh, people who have questions about the Scottish rate will phone up Revenue Scotland rather than us because they might think that Revenue Scotland is operating Scottish income tax. Therefore, we will be working very closely with them to make sure they've got the right information and they can pass the inquiries on to the right place in HMRC. Very helpful. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That appears to have concluded questions from the committee and myself. Are there any uh, further points you wish to make? Um, no, I just look forward to hearing when the time of your budget is going to be. <laughs> and we, we, we all want to hear that. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for answering your questions so comprehensively uh, today. Uh, at the start of the meeting, the committee agreed to take the next four items in private. I therefore would like to call a two-minute recess to allow the public and official report and our witnesses to depart um, as we go into private session. Thank you.